they move to the top of the stretch. Slough, City Slough with a quarter of a mile to go. Has the lead as he has from the start. Ali Sheba on the outside is gaining ground in second. Bet twice is now third. Along the inside, Pleasant Virginian fourth. The battle on the front end. Slough, City Slough at the rail and Ali Sheba on the outside. And down the stretch they come. Ali Sheba puts a head in front. Chris McCarron aboard. Ali Sheba has the lead by a neck. Slough, City Slough second. Here's the finish of the Meadowlands Cup. Ali Sheba by half a length. Hi, here's uh, John Patrick. And today, obviously, we're going to talk about horse racing. How do you handicap the races? Now, today I'm going to be joined by uh, Rick Lang. Rick is one of the top handicappers in the country. You know the program uh, that you get, for instance, at the Meadowlands? Uh, Rick is the morning line maker for the Meadowlands program. In other words, he has to handicap every horse in every race and decide, in his opinion, which are the top horses. And people use the, this is a guide to do their handicapping. What we're going to do now is we're going to talk about uh, how do you handicap the individual using the information that Rick gives you at the track from his uh, experience. But we want you to do it on your own. Now, uh, Rick does the handicapping for the daily racing form. It's a guide. It's the, the Bible of horse racing. And in this tape today, we're going to show you how to take the information that's in the daily racing form and how it's going to affect you at the track, how it's going to help you to handicap the races. Now, the key thing in, in gambling, you know by now, talk about it all the time and all of our tapes and has nothing to do with uh, uh, any particular sort of gambling. It could be casino games, sports betting, horse racing. It's bankroll, knowledge, money management, and discipline. The four things you need to gamble in the big four. Bankroll is the amount of money you take to the, to the, uh, to the track. Uh, knowledge is knowing everything there is to know about every horse in the race, which is in a daily racing form. Money management is how do you bet? What do you bet when you win? What do you bet when you lose? And discipline is how do you walk? When do you walk at a certain point in that day? And you've got to set that goal ahead of time. Now, during the, uh, the tape, I'll be talking about the money management and the discipline approach to the races. And Rick will be going into the technical things as to how do you actually handicap. And I'm going to play kind of a devil's advocate. I'm going to ask him questions that I think that you might ask him if you're going into the track. Now, in your packet, in the tape, uh, you're going to find uh, information. It's a guide as to how you can read the different uh, parts of the, of the form, uh, track variant, uh, trainers, uh, jockeys, uh, weights, uh, things that you might need uh, to do your handicapping. But that's all in the packet, and you should know that by now. You see, the tapes are broken down that we're going to do on horse racing into very basic for the person who's never been to the track before or maybe just once or twice. And this tape here, which is for the intermediate, you go maybe six, seven, eight, nine, ten times a year. And you're, you're pretty aware, well aware of what's happening at the track, but you just need a little bit more uh, information to help you be a strong handicapper. And then there's a very, 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 very deep professional gambler. And that'll be in the tape that we do later on. So uh, the very strong player probably wouldn't be interested in this information. This is for you, the player who goes down a couple of times a year. And we'll talk about money management and discipline. Right, right now, I want you to uh, meet Rick. And, and you know what we're going to do? We're going to just wrap a little bit about the approach to the, to the uh, to the game. Uh, we're going to take a couple of races, a couple of minutes, we're going to go over some, uh, give you some footage, uh, take a look at. Hey Rick, uh, I've walked into the track. I'm up there, I'm going to handicap uh, a couple of races. I said that I would throw out uh, all races uh, that have more than 10 horses. You disagree? Well, John, I have to disagree a little bit because I'm forced to make an opinion on every race, so I've got to look at them and then sometimes I find something I might like in a 12-horse field, so I might play that one. Okay, you've got you to go into every race. Yeah, I've got to yeah, make you, an opinion, make a stand on every single race that they put up at the meet. Okay, so we're in the first race. Uh, you know, using the first race, you've got 12 horses because uh, they want to make it tough enough for the double. Okay, what are you looking for? You've walked up there. It's a maiden race, uh, maiden claiming uh, race. Now, you can't throw it out. You've got to handicap it. Go ahead. What are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for horses that have shown that they have some ability to run. A lot of times in a cheap maiden claiming race, if you've had horses that have started 10 to 15 times, they've shown you one thing. They're really not that interested in the game. So I'm looking for something that either has been lightly raced and showed some ability, and that's certainly the, the type of horse I would make the favorite in that particular situation. How much breeding? Uh, what do you think of breeding? Breeding and maiden claiming is, really doesn't mean that much to me. If they're well-bred, that uh, actually shows me that they're not too th well thought of and they've got some physical problems. If you see something like, like an Alador gelding in a maiden claiming, uh, that horse has obviously got some big hole in him, right? And he doesn't figure to run too well in there. Uh, uh, trainer. Trainer. Well, trainers are very important to me. That's my, 
but it's like anything else in life. There's always people that do well, and the leading trainers at the meet win 60 to 70 percent of the races. So it's uh, that's those are the type of guys you want to go with. Wait, weight to me is not that important, especially when you're talking distances of a mile and a sixteenth and below. When you get up to a mile and a quarter and a mile and a half, then weight can be very important. But I don't think weight is that big a factor. I think it's very overplayed in the game. Uh, we're at this 12-horse field, uh, maiden. Most of them are five and a half furlongs, five furlongs, six furlongs. Two-year-old maiden. Oh, two-year-old maiden. Yeah, right, we're going to two-year-old maiden. Okay. Let's talk to two-year-old maiden. Uh, so you don't care about weight, even with the uh, the maiden. No, especially at those short distances. So it's not five gonna... furlongs, five and a half. They're, they should all be carrying about 120, 118 pounds, and they're usually weighted fairly equally, because you don't get into the weight changes until a horse wins something. And then other horses that haven't won then would get a weight break from them because the other horse has shown that he does have ability and the other horse doesn't. Jockey. Jockey, again, very important, at, especially at minor racetracks. So, like in the New York racetrack area where you have a lot of top jocks, then you could go down to 10 or 15th jock there and still get a competent ride. You go to some of these minor racetracks, you're talking two or three jockeys control almost all the races. Hey, Rick, you hear this, uh, hey, this trainer it doesn't send his horse out to run today. Uh, you're in a maiden race, first race. Do you buy that? Yeah, you know, there's certainly some trainers that it's not by, they're not telling the jockey to hold the horse, but there's certainly some trainers that don't put their best effort into their first start. They want a little schooling for the horse. They show them the gate, let them learn what the game is, because a lot of these guys, the smaller trainers, have to cash a bet to make a living. Right? They're training 10 to 15 horses. They don't win that many races in a year. And when they've got a horse that has some ability and they want to cash a little bet, they want to make sure that they're not going to take a chance on a first-time starter unless they know it's a killer. I mean, if the horse is a killer and they know that the horse just breaks the gate, be, opens up five on the field, and then the kid just sits on for an easy rocking chair ride, then that's another story. But if they've got one that they'd like to cash a little bet with and they're not 100 percent sure, they're going to give them a little education they're first. Gonna let them go. Hey, uh, Rick, okay, we're at that first uh, race. Now, how are you going to eliminate these? Uh, uh, what are you looking for? Okay, we're two-year-old maidens. We're looking to see if they've started. Right? If they have started and they've shown no speed, then we're going to toss them out. Okay. All right, we get those, we'll eliminate those horses, except we've got to look at the bottom of the program and say, oh, excuse me, are we having any equipment changes? Two-year-olds, that's where a lot of moves are made in two-year-old races. A horse, Will, is known, he works every morning in blinkers, and he goes down in 48 which is a decent move. Well, I was going to ask you. What's That's a good? decent move for okay. half a mile. Right. 48 seconds for half a mile. That's four furlongs. All right, a furlong is an eighth of a mile. Right. All right, so the half a mile, he goes in 48. That's a good move, but he goes in blinkers. All right, but the first time they run the horse, they run him without blinkers. And the horse shows no speed, and he's back behind. Now, in his second start, you look down at the bottom of the program, it says equipment change, blinkers on, and put the blinkers on, they open up the gate, and all of a sudden this horse is three in front, and everybody goes, how did that happen? Why all of a sudden this horse was last, last time, now he's three in front with the blinkers on. So um, you use that as your... Uh, one equipment of the changes okay. are very important. Okay, now you, you run it down... Uh, you, with two-year-olds. Yeah, this is only two-year-olds. Older, older, older two -year -olds. horses, they're, they're almost meaningless. Okay, and if you've got a, a, a horse that's raced uh, four or five times, show no speed at all, you throw that right out. You don't even handicap. Yeah, for four or five starts on this horse, this horse obviously should be placed somewhere else. Okay, now you've got it down to the last five horses, uh, uh, which come in together as a, as a clump. You want to pick one or two out of there that's going to be your best pick of the year. Uh, what makes you make that particular horse a number four horse? Uh, what makes you give the four horse the, the, the lead on the program as the uh, best pick? As the best pick or, that as, or as the morning line favorite? Morning line favorite. favorite. Well, yeah. the morning line favorite, I'm throwing factors in there as who the trainer is, who the jockey is. Because when I make the morning line, I'm not saying who I think is going to win the race. I'm deciding who I think the public is going to make the favorite. Okay. I'm trying to let them know what I think is what the legitimate price on this horse is going to be because I think this is what they're going to bet. All right? And if I say the horse is 3 to 1 and he goes off at 2 to 1, then they liked him more than I thought they would. Or uh, in the other direction, if I put a horse at 6 to 5 on the morning line and he goes off at 2 to 1, then I thought the fans liked him more than they, it turned out. They went somewhere else with their money. But don't most of the fans go by the, uh, the, uh, the lines that you set as well, the... Well, uh, the morning line is basically just to give the fans an idea if they're getting any value for their money. For the best three horses in the race. Yeah, if it means there's any value there. Like, if I set a horse at 3 to 1 and he's 3 to 5, I mean, there's no value in that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You, you know, I just want to... Before we come on today, 
Uh, Rick and I were rapping about the uh, different approaches to the game. A lot of this stuff, we've got to cut it down. I'm trying to give you the, the theory as to this. Uh, Rick said that uh, last year, uh, uh, during a period of time, he would pick five horses in a race. 80% of the time, he would have the winner in those five horses. And most of the time, Rick, you said that uh, you had the double, you well, had the, exactly uh, the, the exactly the and trifecta. And the, the many often uh, times the trifecta also. How does the, the guy go into the track, how does he find out that horse is sore? Uh, the trainer's just trying to pick up a day's uh, pay. How do you, as a handicapper, throw that horse out or keep him in for your final three picks? Well, the horse is, will signal a little something to you about how he's, how he's doing. But when you're going, again, dropping down to the bottom, I've found this to be true, and I don't know why it is. When a horse, say, has been running for 10,000, was successful at that level, and then tailed off, because horses don't hold their form for a long period of time, yeah. especially cheap how horses. Long, how long of time will they hold They them? might hold it for a month, yeah. all right? depending, again, on the trainer's ability to, to keep it at that level. A right? horse won his last two races. Do you tend to throw him out or go with him again? No, I don't, I don't like to go with horses that continue winning, especially cheap claimers. And if the horse isn't moving in price, if a horse wins for 10 and then comes back for 10, first off, if he's right, he's not going to be there again because somebody's going to claim him. All right. Right? Somebody's going to get him out of the way because even if they don't like the horse, they don't, they're tired of losing to him. Suppose you ran the runner-up twice in that race. All right, you don't want to run against him the third time, so you just get him out of the way, you claim him, and he's got to ride for another he's level. Go All right, he goes up. up. All right. I just want to go back again and just clarify uh, the last thing we're looking for at the second race of the double, which is at 3,500. I gave it the lowest claiming race. Then you're not even going to pay attention to the fact that a couple of horses are dropping down in, the, in, in class. You're not even going to use that as a, a primary uh, uh, handicapping tool. I mean, class drops you have to respect, but when they drop that far... They're usually there's a big hole in the horse. The, 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 the trainer's telling you something. Yeah. He says, like, you can have them if you want them. I mean, I'm tired of dealing with his problems. You want to put up 3,500, you can drag them over to your barn and see what you can see do with them. Do. But what, what I've found with those type of horses, for some reason, the first time they drop to that level, they don't run that well. But the next time they run back at that same level, they usually perform much better. All right, how about a horse coming from another track? Uh, ran in 5,000 claimant in Aqueduct, for instance, they shoot him over to the Meadowlands and drop him into a $3,500 claimant. Do you give an edge for the horse coming into a track for the first time out or? Uh, from New England. <laughs> from some places. New York trainers, when they're sending something over, they're trying to unload it. It can't do. There's no reason. They run for much more money in New York than they do at our circuit. So the only reason the guy's sending it over there is because he can't make it in New York and he's hoping either he can pick up a person in New Jersey or, wants to get or that somebody else is going to take his headache away from him. So a horse is pretty well live if he goes, for for instance, from, uh, Met, uh, from Aqueduct and they shoot him over to, uh, uh, give me a track, in Laurel. He's pretty well live? If they, if they would go to the trouble to ship one down to Laurel, yeah. If you're going to pay live. the van money, you, you, you feel you right, gotta, that's you, a lot of money to pay that. just to put a for sale tag on a horse. Okay, now we're, we're still at that second race. It's a $3,500 claiming six furlongs. What if the horse is usually running in a uh, mile and an eighth, mile and a sixteenth, hasn't done anything, showed some early speed, dropping them into a six furlong, does it help? Sure. A lot of horses, a lot of horses, I mean, horses are, you know, they have attitudes. They sometimes need to change the scenery. They get tired of, a like, horse shows speed going long but can't carry that speed, drops back to three quarters. I love it. It's called a turn back horse. I love turn back horses. Most people don't realize that 50% of the races are won by horses that are changing the distance that they ran last time. Okay, uh, but the favorite in a race will almost always be the horse that won at the distance last time out that they're running tonight. The same distance. Right. But then do you give an edge to the horse? When you say turn, uh, uh, what do you call it, turnabout? Turn back. Turn back. Turn back horse. Uh, do you like a horse going from a mile and a sixteenth down a six furlong? Right. Or do you like it going from a six furlong stretching out to a mile? I'll go either way, but I want, if they're coming from a, from a route race, Back to a sprint, yeah. I want the horse to have shown speed, preferably brief speed, like maybe run a half a mile. Where, sharp at the front end of the race yeah. or in the middle? No, be up close. How do you compare a, a, a horse that, that shows uh, speed at the end to a closer? What do you like better? Oh, I like horses with speed. Closers, the great thing with closers are the most exciting horses. Those are the ones that people go to watch. Yeah. And we've got them all around us here today is Ali Sheba. And he came from off the pace and would run down horses in front of him. But so many of those horses never get there. Are they passing tired horses, Rick, or are they... Well, uh, sometimes they're certainly that's all passing they're tired horses, but they're also a victim of pace. Now, a real good horse like Ali Sheba, you can ask him for something a little earlier, and he'll give it to you so that a horse won't get loose on him. But when you're dealing with cheaper horses, if some horse gets four in front of a closer, and there's nobody running with him to tire him out, and he's, like, he's all happy, he's out there, he's all alone, he's looking for somebody to run with, and the closer's just never going to get him. You can't get him. So the speed, you, you, you give the edge to the speed, 
And uh, 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 I want to emphasize again, do you like it early in the race, or do you like it uh, in, in its past races, in its past performances, do you like it early, or do you want it late with the speed? Do uh, 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 you want the early speed? Well, the, we were talking about turn back. If a horse was running a route last time yeah. and turning back to three quarters, I definitely want him to have shown early speed in that route race. And then drops down. And he drops price. down. He won't show as much speed in the, in the three-quarter race. Okay. Right? He'll come from a little bit off, and he might be four or five out of it early. Right? But if he's like 15 out of it early, you know, he's going to be one of those horses. He'll be running late, and he's making a big move, but meanwhile the race is over by the time so he, he got he had no shot anyway. Right? Right. Well, he might hit the board, but you know, he's not going to win. So he didn't have a shot at winning. We're talking about uh, crisscrossing for a double, for, uh, take, looking for a double win. I, you know, Ricky's got a, um, a race here we're going to handicap. Take a look at this race. Well, let's start off here with uh, the first race at a uh, typical night at the Meadowlands, a uh, lovely track in East Rutherford, New Jersey, one of um, the leading tracks in America. Uh, the Meadowlands first race that particular evening, this was October 18, 1988, for those of you who keep track of such things. And the first race that night was a mile and 70 yard event for three year olds and up, uh, claiming tags 62.50 down to 6,000. This is your basic bread and butter claiming races, the backbone of the game. Well, it's the majority of races that are run are these type of events. Uh, the first horse in this event was Pistol Point. Uh, Pistol Point last raced on October 7th. He was going a mile and a 16th, which is a little further than tonight's distance, but he had been routing. He was in for 5000 as noted there. The claimant price was 5000 And he finished first in that event. He got up and uh, held on to win by a neck, actually. Okay, then we're going to move down to the second horse was Poor Dad. Poor Dad was uh, scratched that evening, uh, decided not to suit up for this one. Moving on down to the third horse, we've got Pam's Intrepid. Now, Pam's Intrepid last raced on October 10th. He was going in a mile and a 16th event, so again, he's dropping back a little bit in distance. He raced for 7,000 that night, so that was with a little bitter bunch of horses. He uh, broke out of the 10 hole, as noted in that first call there. That shows that his post position which is not a good post to have when you're going long, uh, especially at uh, a lot of race tracks that are like New York tracks and the California tracks, the wider tracks, you have a little more run to the first turn. The mile race tracks, it's a very disadvantageous to come out of the 10 hole. So this horse lost a lot of ground probably going in the first turn. He was prominent and finished sixth. Race before that, though, he ran against the same kind of company he's in with tonight. He was in for the 6250. He drew the one hole. So he didn't lose any ground that night, and he went head and head. He held on longer that time, but then tired and finished fourth. Let's, let's move along down to the next horse. The next horse is Risking Plenty. Risking Plenty raced on September 29th. So he's been absent for 19, day, 19 days, and I'm not particularly fond of horses that have been away that long. And his running lines, as you can see, finished seventh in his last one and ninth before that. I've got him as a throwout. We're not even bother considering him anymore in this particular race. Now moving down to the next horse, we've got Blazing Prospect. Now this is a horse that's shipping in from New England, was running at Rockingham Park. He was on the turf in his last event, was running with classier horses. He was in for 9,000 and finished fourth in that particular event. You go back to his last dirt race, dirt race I've highlighted that there, and that race he was in against Allowance 5,000s, which is a starter allowance race which is the type of race that you can't be claimed out of, and usually they're pretty tough heats. He finished second in that one, so he, certainly he merits some consideration running against these $6,000 horses here at the Meadowlands. Let's move on down to the next horse, and that's Cadmar. Now, Cadmar has raced very recently, which is something I like to see. He was out on October 10th. He was going a mile on the 16th, and he ran for $8,000 that night. And on that particular evening, he finished third. His race before that, though, he raced for $10,000, and he finished third in that one. Now he's dropped from 10,000 to 8,000, and now we're dropping again to 6,250. This is not a good sign. S another good sign, not good sign here, is that Chris Antley, I've got that highlighted, he was one of the top two riders at the Meadowlands and is one of the top riders currently in New York. And he rode that horse in his last start, does not choose to come back on him tonight, and tonight we're going to ride a seven pound bug, Bill Lawless. Now, to me, that's a sign that a horse is not doing well, especially when we're dropping three straight times and we're putting the bug on. So this, is a horse, this horse took a lot of action at the mutuals. As a matter of fact, went off the morning line, went off the favorite and was the morning line favorite. But uh, 
I'm not too high on this horse here. Let's move on down to the next one. The next horse, we've got Ranger 1. And Ranger 1 has been racing, and he raced at a route last time out. He was in for $5,000, and now he's moving up in class off of that race, which was a decent effort. He finished second, getting beat by uh, the horse, uh, the no one horse in here, Pistol Point, in their last start. All right, so if we'll move down to the next one, we've got I'm Ahead. I'm Ahead has been out October 10th. He was going long as tonight's race is, and he was in for 8,000 in his last start. And in his last start, he showed brief speed and then really fell apart late, finishing ninth and beaten off about 12 and three quarters lengths. Now he takes a drop in class, which certainly has to help him, but off of that race, I've got to throw him out. And then we get down to our next horse is Shoot the Sheriff. Now Shoot the Sheriff has been sprinting in his most recent races. He only shows one route on his past performances there. If you look down to July 31st at Belmont Park, he went a mile on the turf. Well, tonight he's going a mile and 70 on the main track. Let's look over and see how he did in his last two sprint events. Now, he was racing for 12.5 in his last one against state breads. That little S there next to the claiming price signifies that he was running against New Jersey breads, All right, so, which he is. The S means state, New Jersey bread, because that's the type of state bread that he was eligible to run in. The race before that, he's in claiming 12,000, and he shows semi-speed. It's not a real good effort, but he's running with better horses. He's stretching out tonight. He's a real long shot possibility, not the type of horse that I could put my money on. Let's move on down to the next horse. And the next one we have is Distonk, and Distonk is October 10th, and he, he has been routing, but as you can see, I've got some slashes through this, and I've eliminated this horse right away. He hasn't been uh, really getting too close, and he's been running this type of company. He'd be a real surprise in here. And the next horse down is Bold RE. Now, Bold RE, again, has been routing. He's been running in this type of company. Actually, he's moving up tonight a little bit from 5 to 6250. But he hasn't been, as you can see by those finishes, he's been 11 lanes, 15 lanes, 8, 22, 25. I mean, Bold RE has not been putting in his best effort. And then we get down to the bottom, and we've got a horse by the name of Law Talk. And Law Talk is the only horse in the race, actually, that raced at tonight's distance in his last two starts. And he's taken a slight drop in company. Actually, this is his second start down here at this level. And last time, he showed a little speed and then tired. And got beat 17 and a quarter lengths, which is not a good sign and certainly not a horse that I could go to the windows with any confidence on. Now, he does have one thing going for him, and that's that Chris Antley, who could have ridden the favorite, Cadmore, moves to ride this horse. And when a top jock like Antley comes over from New York and decides to ride the first race, you've got to give the horse some kind of shot. I'm not going to go to the windows and back it, but the horse certainly merits some sort of attention. He went, went to the trouble to get here for this one. All right, now that we've taken our first run through the chart and taken a look at who might be the contenders here, why don't we go back to the start and we'll pick back up with Pistol Point, who was the number one horse, and, and really take a little more in-depth look and decide who we're going to play if we're going to play at all. All right, we get back here to Pistol Point. A Pistol Point, last one for 5,000 is last start, but it's only his second lifetime win out of 23 lifetime races. Now, I can't go with a horse like that. There's some horses in here that are hard knockers that have won a lot of races. He's only won twice. I'm going to throw him out. Okay, when we move down to Pam's Intrepid. Now, Pam's Intrepid looks like he's starting to come to life, all right? He showed good speed in here when he ran for 62.50. He went three quarters and 11 flat, which is good time, and he only got beat two and three quarters lengths. Then he runs back. His trainer, for some reason, decides to put him in for 7,000 his next start. And he runs fairly well in there, showing, again, some good early speed. But let's take a little further look at Pam's Intrepid. Pam's Intrepid was claimed for $11,000 back in May. And since then, has been beaten off many times. Now, the horse finally starts to come into form when he reaches the Meadowlands. He's done his best racing here. And, of course, he's been dropping steadily in class. But He's yet to find a winner's circle for this new trainer, and I don't think tonight's going to be the night for him either. So we're going to throw him out, even though the public, he was 40-1 to 1 last time, 
coming off a good race, but they take the bug rider off and they put on a journeyman rider, and the fans have bet this horse down to 9-2. to two. There's absolutely no value on this horse, so we're going to eliminate him. We've already eliminated Risking Plenty, so we're now we're going to move down to Blazing Prospect. And this horse is a kind of horse that we get a lot here in the East. The New England trainers love to ship down here when Rockingham and Suffolk uh, tail off at the end of the meet, and they want to run their horses down here where the purses are a little bigger, and they come in and, and they win a lot of races down here. This horse has run with better horses as evidenced. He's, he's won for 62.50 before. He was in the starter allowance. He ran a big race there, and he's coming off of the grass. I personally love horses that come from the grass to the dirt, so I like this horse a little bit. He gets Diane Nelson, who was a top rider up there. Then we move to Cadmar. Cadmar is a horse that has been steadily on the drop in his last three starts. He's 5-2 to two with a 7-pound bug. I don't think Cadmar is the place to go in this spot. Then we're moving down to Ranger 1. Ranger 1 is moving up off a beaten race for $5,000, taking on better horses. Certainly the price is right, gets a real strong rider, long shot possibility, but he's 0 for 13 this year. All right, he's still looking for that first win. I like horses that know their way to the winner's circle, like to have their picture taken. All right, and then we'll move down to I'm Ahead. All right, I'm Ahead was trained by the leading trainer at the meet, Phil Serpy. But this horse obviously is going the wrong way for Mr. Serpy at this point in time, as evidenced by this poor performance last time out. And then we'll move down to Shoot the Sheriff. Shoot the Sheriff is a horse that's dropping way down in class, off of a couple of sprint races, could wake up in here, but certainly not the type of horse that I like to play. You do get a little value, 20 to 1. Certainly the price is square there. Then Dis Donk, who's at 31, we've already eliminated from all chance. And then we have Bold R.E., is a horse that has been running at this level and hasn't been showing much, a little brief speed. We've eliminated him, 45 to 1 on Bold RE. And then down on the bottom, we've got Law Talk, a horse that's won 11 times in his life. And he's three races back, was right there for 10-5. Comes off of a bad race, though, which is not a good sign, but does get Chris Antley, which is a good sign. Well, after further review, I've narrowed this field down to two horses, Blazing Prospect and Law Talk. But... This is the first of 10 races on tonight's card, and uh, I'm really not that fond of either one of them, so I'm going to sit this one out. Why don't we just sit back and watch it and see how it comes out? They're off. I'm ahead. Hustled away quickly. On the outside, De Stonk is there. Shoot the Sheriff is away running in third. Pam's Intrepid is hustled away from the gate in fourth. Taken back, Cadmar now racing in fifth position. Pistol point is six toward the rail. Bold RE was fanned wide going into the turn. And then farther back, it's risking plenty. And a gap of five lengths back to the trailers. Ranger one and blazing prospect. They head for the backstretch. I'm ahead now is hustled clear by three and a half lengths. Shoot the Sheriff is giving chase in second. Dis Donk is running hard in third. Law Talk ranging up on the outside from fourth. Pistol Point tucked along the inside, saving ground in fifth. Bold RE gains on the outside from sixth. He's about six lengths off the lead. Then farther back, it's risking plenty. Cadmar has two horses beaten. That is Blazing Prospect and Ranger One. The quarter went in 22 and four fifth seconds. 46 and one. They're moving at a lively clip as they head for the far turn. It's still I'm ahead by two. Shoot the Sheriff. Cutting into the lead. A gap of three. And Law Talk now has asked for run. Three furlongs from the wire. Outside him, Bold R.E. is fanned wide and fourth. Pam's Intrepid is moving steadily now. And Pam's Intrepid gaining ground from fifth. Cadmar rallies six lengths off the lead now. Pistol point toward the rail. And shoot the sheriff takes over. I'm ahead now is dropping back. Law Talk is in between horses now. And here comes Law Talk charging hard on the outside. It is Boldari coming hard now. They're in the final furlong. Law Talk full out. Boldari shoot the sheriff toward the inside now. They're coming to the wire. Law Talk with a short lead on the outside. Boldari at the rail. Shoot the sheriff. Law Talk has it. You know, you just said uh, the race. You got an idea of, of how Rick analyzed the, uh, the race. Let me, let me go back again, uh, uh, clarify a couple of things. When Rick makes his choices in the uh, program, he is telling you what he believes the public will make a, uh, a horse, what, what he believes that the betting public will do. What we're talking about on this tape here is how we would analyze the race and how he would handicap it and bring it down to the winner of the race. So he popped out uh, Law Talk, and uh, 
It won. Paid a, what did it go up with? 10 to 1, Rick? 10 to 1, yeah. yeah. Paid a 10 which, to was 1. A, which was a, a big overlay on that particular horse when you have a rider like Antley on there. Yeah, now, now, now you use, I'm going to ask a couple of questions which, which you, you might have brought up. Hey, Rick, uh, uh, there was one on here, I forget which one it was, uh, went from a turf to a, a dirt. How do you look at that? Turf to dirt. I like horses moving from turf, especially a horse going around the ground on the turf, shows speed on the turf, tires, and then moves back to a sprint distance, six or seven for a long time. On the dirt? On the dirt. You like that? Like it. The fans don't bet them, and you can get some very big mutuals with that. Okay, opposite, dirt to turf. Dirt to turf. A horse that's moving from the dirt to turf is fine, especially if there's a couple of sprints and now he's going long, but I'd like to have him to have shown that he can win on the grass. Of course, you're going to get a much bigger mutual if the horse has never won on the grass before, and you deserve one because he might not be able to handle it. Some horses just don't handle the surface. I, do you wait for him to have a, a, a race on the turf before you, you make a move or before you put it into your handicap? Unless I know the breeding on the horse uh, uh, definitely says grass. There's some horses that won't... Their offspring, for some particular reason, just runs very well on the grass and won't run on the dirt. There was one in here that ran, went from turf to um, uh, Blazing Prospect. Went right from the turf onto the uh, onto dirt. Yeah, you threw it out. No, uh, no, that was one of my selections, Blazing Prospect. Uh, uh, no, but I mean, in other words, the, uh, when you said throw it out, I mean, you didn't whack it out as this is, this is the horse that's going to uh, go. At, at a rating of, say, one to five, where do you consider going from turf to dirt uh, uh, as, as one of your top handicapping? Uh... When it's a horse that has done his winning on the main track, has never won on the turf, right? He goes to the turf and shows speed, now moves back to the dirt. It's strictly a move that the trainer is pulling to dull, make his form look dull. Right, because he knows the horse won't run well on the grass, okay. and he gets a bad running line on the horse, and the public bets horses with good running lines. Yeah, okay. Favor is almost always the horse that won his last outing or has taken a big drop in class. There was one in here that dropped from a, a twenty thousand claiming, twelve thousand dollar claiming, big drop all the way down to sixty two fifty. Yet you didn't even look at it. Uh, didn't particularly care for the horse because he hadn't run well at any point in his career. It was his first time going long, and he fired big in that race. Yeah, he, yeah. he was right there. He gets beat uh, ahead. So, but he certainly, and the, and the mutual was square, but he just wasn't a horse that I could go to the window and bet with confidence. And certainly if you bet him and he wins, you think, you, well, I'm a genius. And you're certainly happy to get your $42 back for your two. But if you bet those kind of horses continually, you're not going to make a lot of money. You're going to get whacked. You see what we're trying to do is, we're trying to give you, uh, we took a race, we're trying to give you a generic look as to how you would take a race, how you would handicap and what you're going to throw out and what you're going to look at. I'm going to do this to wrap this particular race up. Give me five quick things that he's going to win. He looked at this race. What was the five key things that he threw out, just, uh, which we can make as a generic look to throw out? Uh, well, horses that haven't been within four lengths of the lead at any point in their running line. In, in how many past races? In their last two. Okay. If they haven't been within four lengths of the lead in their last two starts, they've lost interest. Okay, so that, that's, that's one of the first things you look for. Right, you're going to Go look for that. And that's going to eliminate some horses, eliminated some in there. Right. I don't like horses that haven't won. Run, they're running against horses that have won many races in their career. Like the, the one horse in that race, Pistol Point, had won two races in his life, and one of them was for $5,000. Now he's moving up in class. Where a horse like Bold RE, even though I didn't like Bold RE one little bit because his running lines were awful, if you look at his lifetime past performances, he'd won $169,000 in his life. So obviously at one time, he could run. And Law Talk picked up his 12th win in 71 starts. So he knew his way to the winner's circle. You've got to bet on horses that like to win. And there's horses that don't like to win. And as, as you can see, when you look at the PPs on a horse and you look at their lifetime starts, there's some horses, 35 starts, one or two wins, nine seconds, seven thirds. They wait on horses. They get to the lead, and they start looking around. Their ears perk up, and they said, doesn't anybody want to run with me? And bam, somebody comes, and they got them. And they get beat. Hey, uh, one of the key things uh, we talked about, I think we did it in the first segment, too, uh, the fact that Antley got off of a, a, a mount and moved over to Law Talk. The jockey moves are tremendously big, and the, they are so strong on the New Jersey circuit, the New York circuit, they're also strong. Uh, Florida, very big. When a jock, when you see one of the leading riders get off of a horse that's going to be the favorite to ride something else in the same race. That was live. That's a very strong And they didn't pick it up. It wasn't picked up. No. Uh, Law Talk went off at a 10 to 1. And uh, last thing, uh, we talked about the trainers. Okay, you were talking about the, uh, uh, the trainers here. Give me the one last thing you're going to look at uh, to throw out as many horses as you can. 
on this particular race? Well, that that particular race, you didn't use any uh, uh, weights at all. No, no, no the weights, the weights, weights meant absolutely nothing. Okay, and now the last question I'm going to ask. Which I'm is just looking for horses that had won at that distance, and I always look for horses in the cheap races. I look for horses with back class, horses that have beaten better horses, not horses that are cheap horses and they can only win, and have never beaten like the Pistol Point. He had never beaten better horses. So he was a uh, he was a thrower. Go to this. Do you use the the last thing? Do you use uh, the board to influence you. Yeah, there's a friend of mine who calls himself a reactionary player. He reacts to how the fans bet, and I do that somewhat myself. Certainly, if I like a horse and I think I should get three to one, and I'm not getting the three to one, I'm getting nine to five or two to one, then I, I pass it. You know, I'll wait for another spot sometimes. Oh, so. I suppose you like a horse a lot. And, and he's not played? And he's not played. Like this law talk went off at ten to one. You might have handicapped it down, not you. Uh, uh, the player might have handicapped it down to 10 to 1. And you look at it, and you love it. And you look up and say, wow, nobody else likes it. I'm going to throw it out. In, yeah. in some instances, when a horse is dead on the board, if a horse always takes action. And he always is, if you look at his PPs, because on the right-hand side there, it tells you what the horse went off in his last start. If a horse is 4 or 3 to 1 and all his starts, and all of a sudden is going off at 10 to 1, that, you know, that's, that's intimidating. Is that's going to tell you this horse is dead, the barn doesn't like him, nobody likes him. But when a horse gets Antley to ride, now you're talking about here, Antley moves to this horse, that's a strong play. Now, if it's some other jockey and he's 10 to 1, he probably, well, he obviously would have been higher if Antley hadn't been on him. Yeah, I like what you said. Uh, if you caught one of the things that Rick said before, Antley goes down to ride in the first race. You know he's there for a, for a reason. That was live. These are the things you're going to have to look for when you pick up on these lower claiming races. All right, this is the sixth event from the Meadowlands a turf course event, a mile and a sixteenth. This is a claiming event for fillies and mares, three-year-olds and up. And they'll be running for a claiming price of 50000 down to 40000 You know, we're going to analyze this race now. Uh, you know, I'm going to ask Rick questions. And I'm going to ask uh, questions that maybe you would have asked as to why, uh, why the first race, why, why the first horse is 35 to 1. Why shouldn't it be better? Why shouldn't it be worse? So we're going to go down it. Hey, Rick, first one, Rebaldry. You threw him right out. Well, she's had a little trouble making contact with the field late there, as you look. She's got beat 13 and 3 quarters lanes, 30 and a half lanes, 32 lanes, 31. Let's add that up. We're talking about 140 lanes in her last four starts. I mean, she, to me, she's an instant toss. Right out the door. Right out the Don't door. even look at it again. Go to the next one. Jarkaz. Now, Jarkaz, as I have highlighted there, finished second for 35000 in her second race off of a year layoff. It was a big, big race. She was the favorite that day. Now she comes back and runs on a good turf course. She might not have liked that course. She ran with a little better fillies. Ships back to this side of the river. They change pilots. Now we got, instead of Randy Romero, who's one of the top jocks in the game, we've got John Melendez. But we don't have three to one here. We got 11 to one. 11 to one. Hey, Rick, this, look at this. Go, yeah. go here. Now, why, did, why didn't they bet this horse down with six wins, six places, and three thirds? Why didn't they touch it? I believe because of the last bad running line and the fact that John Melendez is riding and not somebody like Randy Romero. I mean, how can you not bet this, Philly? She's over 50% in the money. Oh, I, I like this one. Weights in, in, in line. I mean, it's got a good uh, pass record, and yet somehow this one got away. And has accumulated $87,000 in turf earnings. Yeah, right here. Yeah, you got to, uh, you're paying a price. All right, next one, uh, worth the sum. Uh, worth the sum. This is a shipper. She's coming out of handicap races, but they're up in New England. Really, we don't. What do we know of handicap races in New England? They could be claiming horses for all we know. This horse has a good turf record, though. If we look over there, she's won three, has four seconds and three thirds, so she has ability on the weeds. You might use her underneath in an exacta here. Hey, uh, uh, Rick, a turf uh, course in New England, as opposed to a turf course in New Jersey for where she's shipping now, uh, uh, what's the difference? Well, all turf courses are different, John. They, every, every racetrack has their own turf course, and they all vary in size. Some turns are tighter on others. Some of them are seven-eighths turf courses. Some of them are mild turf courses. Some of them are even larger than that. So there, there are differences, plus the grass is different on a lot of turf courses. Okay, now when you look at this, are you giving any edge to the fact that she's shipping in? You, you, you're going to give her an edge for shipping in, or are you going to uh, give her a, a minus factor because she's just coming first time out? Well, Ed T. Allard has shipped into the Meadowlands many times in the past and has done well. So I wouldn't give it an edge, but I certainly don't take any points away from him because of who he is. Okay, so in other words, this one here, you think the price is right at 6 to 1. Do you like, the, do you like it based on, on the figures you see on the, uh, on the board? You don't like the... Uh... I'm not wild about her because her best thing is speed, and there's, there's speed in here. All right. And we're going to get to that speed. Yeah, that's it. We'll get to the... Uh... 
All right, here's the one uh, we talked about. One winner, eight races. Transgogo was a big upset the day that she did one. You know, she paid $50. She wasn't well regarded. She was coming off a bad, bunch of bad races. I don't see her in here tonight. Yet she went up at, uh, up to 17 to, to 1. Well, up at 17 to 1, did nothing, finished 16 lengths out. Now they drop her down to a uh, 9 to 1. Why did drop in the price based off of a bad race? That's a mystery to me. Yeah. I know, I, you know, I can't see it. We got the same jockey. There's no reason that we got a jock change that's going to pull down the action. I really don't see it. Yeah, no, I don't see any, uh, uh, no past performance on, on the turf. Like you say, she paid $50 on one. Uh... The only thing you could look at is she came out of an allowance race for 20000 She moves back in for a claiming price. Social conduct and pennant winner who are the horses that she ran against last time are a little better horses than these. I think looking at it, my opinion, uh, they're throwing out the last race, you're saying, too. Yeah. Throwing oh, out yeah, the last race and going they're, down. They're tossing the last and going yeah. back to the first. I don't like it, so, uh, uh, but would you throw it out, too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Curious Case. Curious Case is a three-year-old running against older fillies and mares. I'm usually not too high on that, but it is late in the year. It's October, so it's only a little longer before she becomes a four-year-old herself, as, you know, all horses have their birthday on January 1st. Uh, Rick, go back to that. Uh, you say you don't like younger horses, horses running against older ones. Right. Uh, uh, hit me. Well, an older horse is more mature and has certainly is, is larger, just larger, stronger, and has, knows more what they're doing. Three-year-olds... Some horses don't get started. Now, this filly ran when she was two. She had ten starts in her two-year-old career and then has raced seven times this year as a three-year-old and has beaten older horses. As evidenced here, it says three and up. That's what this three with the arrow means next to it. That was down Atlantic City going a mile and eighth, and it was an allowance event, and she won off rather easily. Went easy? You know, she's got two out of four winners on the turf. Uh, that's her home, do you think? Yeah, obviously she does her best running on there. And she can handle yielding turf. I said before she ran at Delaware, it was actually Hialeah Park. She handled a yielding turf course there and again won an allowance race. So you can, you can make a case for this filly. She's coming out of a race for 75000 and taking a pseudo-class drop. And the reason I say pseudo-class drop is because three-year-olds run for much bigger price tags than older horses. So these fillies that are running for 75000 when this filly turns four, it might turn out that she's really a $35,000 horse. But when they have them as three, the lowest price they'll run, say, in New York is 25000 for three-year-olds. As soon as their three-year-old year is over, those horses can't do at 25000 They've got to drop to lower price tags. So I say it's a pseudo-class drop. It looks like it's a class drop, but it really isn't. Uh, go back again. You had a jockey change the last race, come back again to uh, Molina. Right. But uh, that, does that use it? Well, Molina's your... obviously had success with this filly. He's won twice on her, and he has a second. Uh, Pazua is certainly a good rider in his own right, so the jock changed their ox. But I mean, you like a guy that knows how to win with this horse. He obviously gets along with her. So, in other words, e even though uh, if you were looking at this over a generic, anytime you're going to look at a, a, a horse in this class here and the same pattern, are you throwing it out or are you going to give it a look? No, this horse, I've given this horse a look. look okay. She, I mean, she likes the weeds. Okay. All right now we move to Pia's baby. Now, if we move to Pia's baby, let's just look at the turf record here. She's got eight wins in 17 starts, two seconds and three-thirds, right? For 13 out of 17, one, two, three. Small surprise with Chris Antley in the irons. She's four to five in this spot. Now, she's coming out of a race in New York where she ran for $50,000, prompted the pace, and finished second, and was three lengths in front of nine, 10 other fillies, right? She finishes second. It was a 12-horse field, right? And she finishes second in that spot. Hey, you know, Rick, uh, clearly, based on, uh, uh, you know, past record, uh, what you, you know, I would see her as being down to three to five, two to five. You know, four to five looks like a good price on a, you know, with the rest of the garbage that's in this race. Yes, no, she, she looks very strong in this particular event. There's got to be a key. There's got to be a key for, uh, for this one here. So in other words, this is a, this is a trying. Go, uh, go over here, too. You got a uh, 13 out of 17 in the money on right. the turf. You, you got to go with this. Uh, she's very strong, and she's the main speed here. Mm -hmm. she, last time she ran at the Meadowlands, there's a three-quarter fraction. She's four in front. She went nine and one. Uh, look, look at this two here. Uh, hey, Rick, look at the contending. She's in her last four, five, six, seven races. You know, there's a consistent. I mean, how can you throw this one out? You, you, you know? can't. You can't throw this that's one out. That's why she's four to five. Yeah, that's why. That's why. And, and should win. All right, the next filly, Tagalog, has talent, and she can run on the weeds. All right, there's evidence here. She likes, obviously gives her running late, never seems to get there. But she hasn't been out since July, John. And, I mean, it, some trainers are very good, and Murphy's an excellent trainer, but... It's really asking a lot, especially for a seven-year-old mare who hasn't been out now in four or five months, 
and ask him this horse to be at the top of their game. And she's going to have to be at the top of her game to handle a PSB. So she's no factor, uh, as we, you look at it, she's no factor as a win. She might get a piece. Could get a piece, but not in my book. And, and obviously, if you're going to bet her, it looks like the show spot is the spot you want to have her. If this was a, uh, an exacted race, would you stick her with Pia's baby? No. Wouldn't stick she her. hasn't been out. I figure she's going to need a race. Okay, this isn't an exact race. Pia's baby, uh, uh, this is your pick in the race. Have you seen anything so far that you would touch uh, uh, crisscross in the, in the exact with Pia's baby? Yeah, I have. I'd like Jar Kaz and Curious Case. And we might take a little with worth the sum. Okay, but Tagalog is not one of them. Tagalog is not one of them. Hey, Rick, we're back to a horse that's been away for, uh, this is four months now. She's been away. You want a, you want a, uh, a race under her belt before you go and give her a look? Definitely. When, especially when you're talking, this is a older mare, all right? She's seven years old. Most mares are in the breeding shed by the time they're seven. She's still out on the racetrack. She may not be as interested as she once was. She, she's going to need a race and especially going a distance of ground. You, it's a lot easier to get a horse ready to run three quarters of a mile than it is to get a horse to run a mile 16th on the first race back. And it's very difficult for a lot of trainers to do either. Some it, trainers just don't excel in that. Well, in, in what you're saying in a roundabout way, this is probably just a workout for her. Yep. Being that Good far out, it just is probably just a workout because he knows she's got no chance against Pia's baby. Uh, even though she's got some, he might pick up a day's pay. Uh, right. Well, she showed us once before here. She was off from October 86 to May. Yeah. All right. She came out. She took it. But she was running allowances then. She dropped in for a tag that time for the first time. And she ran well, but she's back early and comes on and gets she through. She got no early speed at all. Right. Nothing at all. We talked about that once before. This is, this is her. This is the, the, uh, the distance she should stay in. But today, you would just sort of sound. You know what we're, we're trying to push this, uh, Rick, is for people to get an idea as to how to handicap what they're looking for in, in a particular uh, uh, race like this, what you're looking for in a Well, moment. certainly you, you want to stay away from horses that haven't been active. Okay. Right. Now we move down to Turn It Up. Now, Turn It Up certainly got good when Vinny Sava put her on the grass course here and uh, move her up from 12.5. She airs for the 20. She comes back for 32,000. So he looks like, you know, he's got an international good thing and he caught some guy napping because the other trainer had never tried her on the turf course, right? She'd been three starts on the turf and all of them here. Now, he had her for 28 starts and never tried her on the grass. Vinny Savas says, I think this filly can grass. So he puts her on there. He turns out that he's right. Tonight, though, she's running 11, 11 and 4, and 11 and 2. Tonight, she's running against Pia's baby, 10 and change, 9 and 1. She's not going to get close to this filly. She okay. can't run with her early. Okay, now, you're, you're saying, are you, th are you throwing out this last race? I can throw out the last race, but tonight, see, she's a one-dimensional filly. She's got to have the lead, yeah. right? She's got to be up there on the front end. She can't run with Pia's baby. So she she's going to lose interest. She's going to chase her. She'll try her. But as soon as she can't get to her, she's going to give it she's up. She's going to give it up. Yeah, uh, hey, Rick, uh, they've made her 6-1, uh, to one, second, uh, second choice on the board. You think it's because of the last? Certainly, uh, off of those, uh, off of those, those two races. races. Yeah. But you don't see her. No. All right, uh, uh, go to these uh, comments on latest workouts. We're, we're talking to the uh, level two uh, player. It goes 10, 12 times a year. Should they use latest workouts and explain it? Uh, four furlongs uh, fast, uh, handily, breezing. Uh, explain it briefly how you look at uh, what, if you're going to use workouts, how important is it, and do you use it in your handicap? Okay. Well, the, let's look at these, these workouts here. This filly is a good work filly. She doesn't work often because it seems like they run her fairly often. She goes a half and 48 and two breezing. That's a very good move. That's one of the biggest misnomers with the, with the form. A lot of people think that breezing is asking the horse to go hard. When in, in reality, when a horse is said to be breezing, he's doing it all on his or her own. All right? It's it, not being pushed. The, the jock, if anything, is trying to slow the horse down. Okay? So you, when you see breezing, what's a good uh, uh, work for four furlongs? That's a good work. There. That's a good 48 work. and 3. Okay. For anytime you're in the 48s, 49 breezing is a good work. Okay. All right. A handy work is when the horse is being asked for something. Like, all, not a little race. I mean, the jock doesn't have the whip out and he's not jumping up and down, but he's shaking her up. He's up at the top of the lane. He might, like, turn her loose a couple of times and chirp to her and get her to run. And that's a handy work. Well, we get a lot of calls on that because everybody thinks when a horse is going handily, we mean that the horse is going very easily. When it's just the opposite. Now, when we term a horse a handy winner, we did mean that he was going easily. All right, then, do you use latest workouts as a big part of your handicap? Only if the horse has been away. 
Oh, that's the only time but you'll use yeah, latest only workout. if the horse is so if it's in it. if it's in uh, uh, works now the horse is if a horse is constantly running all right you're not going to work them too often okay uh, okay we're going to go back to this on the, on the next uh heavier race we go into uh, your your picks on this one well the pick is obviously pia's baby and i'll take a jar cas underneath i'll take a little worth the sum underneath and i'll take some curious case okay you got to narrow it down to two okay well then i'll take uh Jar Kaz and uh, worth the sum. To chase P's underneath baby. P's baby. P's yeah. baby wins. P's baby. Yeah. Right? I'm giving her the race. Yeah. All right. And I'm just playing the other two. Okay. And I'm looking at the exactactus. I'm I'm getting an exactus. Yeah, that's right. what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to push right. for for the exactact. Well, picks. I'm in I'm you, in the exact, but yeah. why can't I use three? Yeah, that's right. You crisscross three. <laughs> I okay. mean, I can get a part wheel. They sell them. I know. All right. Yeah. So I might I might take a little more on this one. I just use this worth the sum as a saver. Okay. And a curious case. My my main pick would be Pia's baby with Jarkaz. Those are the two horses that have done their best running on the turf and have won the most money. Let's look at the money. This filly, eighty three thousand. This one gets eighty seven thousand. The rest of them aren't even close to that close. number. Uh, while we're on this, uh, uh, we're going to touch this later when we sit down and talk. Uh, you like Pia's baby all the way. Right. Would you wheel Pia's baby with everything in the race? Would you take Pia's baby with your next three, or would you crisscross Pia's baby with your next two picks? Now, I would take Pia's baby on top here in this particular instance. When you say on top, are you going to throw out anybody? Well, I told you, I'm taking Pia's baby on top of Jarkaz, a little worth the sum, and some curious case, okay. and for, forget the rest. Standing in good order, and they're off. And Pia's baby breaks alertly on the outside. From the middle of the pack comes Worth the Sum. It passes for the first time. It's Worth the Sum out for the lead. Pia's baby to put pressure on early and turn it up is right there in hand on the outside, running along in third. Transgogo has come out racing in fourth. Jarquez tucked nicely along the rail in fifth. Curious Case is sixth. Then it's Ribbletree, and the early trailer is tag along. And the field moves into the turn now, and it's Pia's baby now out for the lead. Pia's baby is angled over to the rail turn it up is just off her flank on the outside second worth the sum is now dropped back in third transgogo is alongside her and moving steadily now from fourth jarquez patiently racing along in fifth position curious case unhurried on the outside sixth and then farther back are the trailers ribaldry and tagalog and they continue up the back stretch pia's baby prompted by turn it up two and a half lengths to worth the sum and transgogo jarquez along the inside now moves through an opening as worth the sum givers the rail and then it is curious cases just five lengths off the lead tag along and ribaldry as they round the far turn it is still pia's baby they haven't reached her yet pia's baby now opening up under a hand ride there by three turn it up now as asked for run but can't gain on the leader jarquez continues to move through an opening toward the rail worth the sum swings out for the stretch drive and curious case they're set down for the drive now and it is pia's baby chris Hanley aboard in front by five Jarquez is full out, but a distant second, and then Curious Case, followed by Worth the Sum, and Tagalog, and Pia's Baby in hand under the wire to win it easily. Five and a half lengths clear, then Jarquez and Curious Case. All right, we're moving along to the seventh race here at the Meadowlands. This is a sprint race, three quarters of a mile for three-year-olds and up at a claiming price of 16000 down to 14000 Okay, uh, Peter ba uh, Baker, you threw that out. Yeah, Peter Baker's the throw out. He's a router, and he hasn't won for this kind of money in a long time. The Go next, ahead, the next horse, down. Victory One, is a horse that obviously had some talent early in his career. He won a stake race here back in 1986. He had raced in 87, but very sparingly, had three starts, and then made his first appearance this year and ran fairly well for 25,000. He drops down in his second effort this year and certainly figures well here, but uh, maybe not to be two to one. You know, they listed over here, Rick, is no factor in his last time out. Even if he offered five to one his first time out, why did they drop him to two to one? This time around, because he's taking a large drop in class. He was in for 25,000. He was running with better horses. He also was prominent there. You see the first call of the race. Here, this is his post position in the race. The first number here, the seven, is what, how he broke in that field. And the next one is where he was at the quarter. So after they'd run a quarter of a mile, he was only two and a half lengths off the, the lead. Then after a half a mile, he's six, but still only five and a quarter out of it. And then he maintained fairly well from there. At the stretch call, he's four. And at the finish, he's beaten four and three quarters lengths. 
not a real bad effort in his first time back, and the time of the race was a very fast 109 and 1, if we can move back to the time here. These were the fractions. The first quarter was running 22. The half went in 44 and 3, and the final time was 109 and 1. Now, uh, he ran, from what I can see, uh, pretty evenly. Right. Yet they put over here as his uh, uh, explanation, comment, uh, no factor. Uh, if, you know, two people looking at it would say, gee, he wasn't even a factor in the race. But if you analyze it the way you just did, you would have seen that he didn't run a bad race. Well, there, there's no factor is that he wasn't a factor is that he didn't threaten to take the okay. lead at any point in the race. Now, he showed no speed at all, which is something that you like. Yet so you think he's, he's uh, qualified to, to get no, a tag of two to one. He showed decent speed, and he was within two and a half lengths of the lead that went in 22. We've okay. got to give him credit for a little speed in there. Okay, but I want them to see how, what you see in, that, uh, in the charts, how they're going to go look back and, and see. Well, well he's, you know, he, right in here, he's fairly close to the lead. Okay. He, sh he flashed some speed. And now, again, he's taking a drop in class, so that should get him closer to the lead this time around. All right, the next horse is Alatom. Now, Alatom comes out of a 12-5 claiming race in which he was claimed. All right, in that race, he showed speed and had the lead after half a mile, he was ahead in front, and then he tired and finished third. He had the top rider on him, Chris Antley, he was part of an entry. If we look over here, this signifies that he was an entry. He went off at one to two, all right, it was the betting favorite, that's what that little star there means, and the E signifies that he was in an entry. And he was the, actually wasn't the stronger half of the entry in that particular instance. But he gets third, he gets claimed, he's moving up in class. He has speed, but this race shapes up with a lot of speed, and I don't see much from this horse in here tonight. Now we move to Star of Prosperity. Now, I'd like to talk about this horse for one minute because it's something that has, bothers me when I see this done, and I don't know why it's done, whether it's the owner or the trainer. But there's some people, in this case it is the owner and trainer because this fellow owns and trains his own horse. Now, this horse is 45 to 1 doesn't have a chance in here. But if we go back to February 23rd, in 88, down at Tampa Downs in Florida, this fellow claimed this horse for $3,500. And the horse got beat that particular afternoon. Now since then, he put a lot of time and effort into this horse because he didn't bring it back till July 1st. So he worked on this horse. And he paid feed bills on this horse out of his own pocket. And he brings the horse back and runs it for $20,000 and the horse runs the race of his life and finishes fourth, beating three and a half lengths. Then he puts him in the next time for $12,000, and he finishes second and gets beat a length. Since then, he's been in various situations. The horse is still looking to win, but if you claimed a horse for 3500 John, where would you run him back? A little bit higher, not, up, not where he's running him. Right? I mean, if that was my horse, I'd have run him back for $5,000. Right. Mm -hmm. He'd have won from here down to Atlantic City, and we'd still be spending the money. He's not even paying the bills with, uh, I mean, he's got, him, he's got him way out of class. Why is he still, okay, now, you say it bothers you. Well, what, what, well, why I mean, is he? He had this horse right. He put the time and effort into this horse. I mean, you want to sit on a horse. Most trainers, when a horse starts to go bad, they drop him in class and say, listen, you pay the fee bills on him. You take the time to get this horse right again. But he put the time in and then runs him out of line where he's going to have him going bad again. And he's obviously not too well regarded in this heat tonight. You I just don't understand could, the thinking behind this. You feel if he dropped into a ten thousand seventy five hundred dollar claiming race, he could he could go uh, he could win easily. If we'd run him for five thousand, we shipped into Atlantic City. They run five thousand yeah. dollar claimers. Yeah. We'd have been in Atlantic City, July first. We put him in for a nickel. He'd have won Going from away. there to the casinos. Yeah, that's right. And we'd have cashed a big ticket. Nobody's going to bet him. He's coming out of Tampa Bay. He's got, he's shown some good uh, good good races. Okay, so, so you're throwing this it's one just out. like and there's so many times you will see that when if a horse is claimed for less than he's run today and has run five or six times and isn't getting it, there's no sense even considering the horse. So he's completely out. Yeah, he's out. Okay. And the next horse is Sly and Bold. Sly and Bold won last time out for this money. He's got plenty of speed, ran some very fast fractions, but he hasn't been out since August 31st. Why? Where's he been? Something. Obviously, he didn't pull up too good from that one, and now he comes back and shows one work since. I, I don't th see too much in him tonight. And nobody else says 12 to 1? Yeah. Now we're moving down to the next horse, General Snoop. Uh, General Snoop has been very consistent and has been running very well since he was claimed by his trainer. He's been running against state breads in allowance company, which are very difficult races to handicap and to put a number on what these horses are worth. 
because horses that have been going well for 10,000, actually this horse went into it off a losing race for 16,000 and gets beat a nose his first time in that kind of condition, then comes back and wins two in a row. All right, this horse is a speed horse. Again, we've, got, we've already witnessed there's three other horses in here with good early speed. This horse is way over bet, but that's because of the presence of Julie Crone in the irons. And she's, when she's in, on a horse, they're betting the horse. So this horse figures to run up there early, may hang on for part, but is going to be hard-pressed to take this group all the way. One, one key factor as to why you're throwing it out, they bet it down to two to one, making it a co-favorite. What's the main thing that you're throwing it out for? Pinpoint. There's a ton of other early speed in here. The horse has never shown that he can beat some of the better horses in here, and he's way over bet. Over bet, probably uh, because of Crone. Oh, way over bet. Yeah. All right. All right. The next horse is Zealot, and Zealot is a horse that has very, very good early speed, but as you can see, he runs well for about a half a mile, and then he loses interest. He hung on down there at Monmouth back in August, where he went wire to wire. But since then, he shows speed for a half a mile, and then packs it in late. Now, here's, again, he's a horse that's going to be up there. He figures to contend. Very few horses ever get in front of this horse. If you look at his first call, you see a lot of ones and twos in there. If the first quarter mile, this horse is always prominent. He's right. out of the gate every time? Right. Out of the gate. All right. He's quick from the gate. He's, he's got good speed early. So he's just another horse that's going to make these other horses run very fast early. Do you label a horse like this with all that early speed, yet with a rotten record of four wins in 28 lifetime, you, uh, no heart? Yeah, this horse, I mean, I've watched this horse perform most of his career, and he is a horse that he needs to make an easy lead to be effective. Yeah, so, and he quits. Yeah, he's a quitter. Okay, so he's out. He's out. Then we move to Keyline Credit. Keyline is a horse... Again, here's a horse that was claimed for 14000 Trainer moved him up to twenty-five. He ran a real big race, gets beat a neck. Then he tries him in a couple of allowance events, and he runs well in there. Then he puts him in for an outlandish price tag of 45000 on the next start. Didn't pull up too good from that, and he hasn't been back since July. All right, shows a couple of very slow workouts for this. 54 breezing, I wouldn't even... I, if I was a clocker, I might not even put that one in. I think they gave him that as a workout so that to have something to put down on the paper. I mean, 54 breezing is, is not a whole lot of effort going into that. Most horses can gallop that fast. Yet they, they banged him down to 5-1. to one. It, 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 Could it be on this, Rick? He's got himself this year, 88, 7 out of 11 in the money, uh, uh, 7 out of 15 in the money uh, in 87. He, he shows consistent, you know... Uh, well, he's a hard knocker, no uh, question yeah, about yeah. it. And as you can see, but he, he was down here once before, all right? This is a horse, like, he never won for the 45. Yeah. They had him for the 45, so they're betting him off the class drop, saying, well, he won for the 14, so he can handle this kind of company. Okay, plus they're giving him a, yeah, he won at 14. That's right, yeah, and with the, with the weight drop, you, you feel, but 5 to 1, you still think it's a... I mean, so, certainly he's a horse you can consider, but I don't like, this is what I don't like right here. That's all I, the horse has not been out in the last 18, 20 days. I'm not too interested. So you're throwing, you would throw this yeah, one I'd throw him out just on the fact that he hasn't been there. Okay, now why is, uh, uh, why is Lively Native with Antley with a 7-1? Uh, well, because he's a horse that's making his second start off a layoff. All right, he was away since June 10th. All right. Now, this is a horse that was claimed by Bob DeBonis for 35000 All right. He runs him for 45000 He runs him for 60000 then he starts to put him on the drop. He puts him in for the 32, doesn't perform so well. Then he puts him in for 25,000, and the horse runs well. He gets second. Well, then he picks up a little check. Then he brings him back again for the 30, and the horse does not perform well. He had Jose Santos. Obviously, the horse wasn't going well. But now Mr. DeBonis takes this horse and gives this horse some time off. He freshens him up, works on the problem, but unlike some of these other trainers that bring him back for twice and he claimed this horse for 35. He brings him back for 16. All right, he puts a seven-pound bug rider on in this last heat. The horse goes seven-eighths of a mile over Belmont Park, shows good early speed, and tires, finishes third. Now, he's running for 16.5. Now, this race was probably a race for 18.5 down to 16.5. So, right? in other words, why didn't Antley then drop the price a little bit more based on the fact you think that he's been freshened? Well, that, you know, that I'm not sure of. I don't know why the, the uh, betters ignored, basically overlooked this horse. They, they got carried it. away with, with Julie's horse, yeah. speed horse, and got carried away with this horse, the back class, 
the horse that had won the common stakes victory won so this horse looks like he's a very classy individual but lively moving back down here to lively native lively native has back class he was a much more solid horse than 16,000 he showed something and he did something I like. He's being brought back right away. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He w ran well on October 6th. He's coming right back into the entries. We take a seven-pound bug rider off, and we put Chris Antley, one of the top riders in the game today, on this horse. you got to like this horse. If you're going for, cla for uh, uh, price, if you're going for uh, value for your money, at 7-1, to one, this looks like a better shot yeah. than, the, uh, than Crone at 2-1. to one with the, the, uh, Going to this... Uh, uh, let's suppose it's uh, an exact race. Who are you putting on top as your number one? Well, the, the number one choice in here? Your opinion. I like Lively Native. I love Lively Native. Okay, you like Lively Native yeah. at, at uh, top. Give me two others in there for, uh, for an exact at Criss Cross. All right, well, I'd, you got to worry about victory one, and I'd have to box him because he certainly figures that he could run well in this one. And I'd take a little flyer with Alatime. Uh, the trainer of Alatime has been known to move horses up. And uh, he claimed this one for 12.5. He's coming back for the 16. If you look at the horse's lifetime record, he's not, he hasn't run that well this year. He's only won for 18. But the horse certainly picks up checks. 14 out of 18 in the money. I was right. going to say to you, you'd put him in so, there to get a piece. So I'd, I'd give him a shot for getting a piece of this. Hey, Rick, and you like nobody as a standout and, uh, to wheel on top, but you like him as a box. Right. Uh, uh, so in other words, this is a type of a race that if they're doing a handicapping uh, for an exacta or a trifecta, you're looking for a box in this race rather than taking uh, Lively Native on top. Well, I might take a little bit of Lively Native in the wind pool just because he's such, an, in my opinion, an overlay. Okay, so in other words, what you could do then, you could box Lively Native, all the time and victory one. victory one, and then put a couple of bucks on Lively Native on the side to win right. because of the price. Yeah, oh, okay. it's a tremendous price. Okay, and uh, a Broadway Sunrise is out of scratch. Okay, we'll take a, a pop at this race and, and see who you pick. They're off. Lively Native breaks in stride and comes out running for the lead. Also on the outside, Keyline Credit is right there, and from the middle of the pack comes Star of Prosperity. Also driving hard, Sly and Bold, who emerges with the lead now. It's Sly and Bold who fights it out and comes away with a short lead. On the inside, all the time is right there. Star of Prosperity is in between those two. Lively Native is running hard and forth. On the outside, Zealot four wide going into the turn. Just in behind them, it's Victory One now racing in sixth position. Keyline Credit is seventh, followed by General Snoop. And outrun early, it's Pete the Baker as the field rounds the fire turn. And from the outside now, Lively Native forging to the front. It's Lively Native in front by a neck. Sly and Bold is full out this try to stay with that one. Keyline Credit is coming out for the drive in third. All the time is now back to fourth. General Snoop is set down for the drive and victory one. Coming to the final furlong, it is Lively Native pulling away by four. And Lively Native by five is just pouring it on now. And victory one is second as Chris Antley comes bounding home to his third winner. Lively Native by three and a half. Victory one second and Keyline Credit third. All right, you know, we're moving into, uh, into the ninth race now, and, uh, you know, this is the type of race that I like. I personally like this myself better. You see, there's only a couple of horses in the race. So we're going to go over this one here. Moving along here to the ninth event, we've got a turf race here, a mile and a sixteenth over the Meadowlands turf course, an allowance event for fillies and mares, three-year-olds and up, which have never won a race other than maiden, claiming, or starter. All right, we start here with Miss Sarah Joy, John, and this horse... If it was in April of the year, I wouldn't particularly look at this horse too strongly in this type of event. This is non-winners of one other than maiden or claiming. That means that these horses have never won an allowance race. They could have won as many claiming races as they care to, but never have beaten better horses. Now, earlier in the season, you're going to be up against the good ones, and, of course, the good ones by now should have run through these condition races, as they're known as. Now... This filly is coming off of some real good races. She's run well on the grass. Actually, she's a five-year-old mare, but she's run well on the grass. She likes the grass. It has to be considered in here. All right, we move down to the next horse, Private Fame. All right, Private Fame is a three-year-old filly all right, who hasn't run through these conditions. She's had 12 chances, though, and took her a while to break her maiden. And when she did break her maiden, it was on the grass, but it was at Atlantic City, which is not as uh, top-notch a race track as it was in the past, so she was facing a little weaker competition down there. Now, she comes out of a race where she finished second, going a mile and a quarter over a sloppy racetrack. 
Now, she went off the favorite that day, and she got beat six and a half lengths. Now, she moves back to the weeds. Jose Santos is over here to ride, and certainly that's one of the reasons that this horse is four to one. I don't like this filly at all. I think that I know the field she raced against last time was an absolutely weak, weak field of fillies, and she's facing better in here tonight. Do you put, uh, Eric, you put anything on beaten favorite? She went off the favorite last time at $1.90, beaten, even though, uh, uh, you know, she came in second against a bunch of, of so-called pigs. Now she's jumping up against some, some live ones, uh, going off at 4-1. to one. Uh, Do you put anything on a uh, beaten favorite? Well, I would have accepted it's Santos that rode her last time, and that's why she was the favorite. You know, if you rode another jockey who wasn't a prominent, I mean, H Jose Santos at that point in time was making a run for the national title, which is the reason he was over here to ride this horse anyway. He would ride anything because he wanted to win the national money title which he did, and hence won an Eclipse Award, all right? But that's why he was over here, but that's why the fans bet him. Well, he's over here now. Right. He's, he's listening for him to, so you think he's live? Uh, 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 well, live. no, I mean, certainly he's going to be he's putting his best effort, but I'm saying that the horse was over bet last time because S oh, okay. Santos was in the irons. If Santos wasn't in the irons tonight, this horse wouldn't be 4-1. Gotcha. Thanks. All right. Now, the next horse, Galaxy Miss. She has one start in this country. It was here at the Meadowlands. She showed nothing. We can just uh, eliminate her immediately. She never made any kind of effort at all. And yet they knocked her down to 13 and 1. Well, again, it's a short field. Sure, yeah. People are going to bet horses. The horse did win on the grass, but it was going two miles at, uh, in a track in Ireland. I mean, we're going a mile and a 16th tonight. You've got to have a little speed. She showed none. Nothing. All right. The next horse, Pathos, is a scratch. Hatina. There's another horse that comes out of that same race with Road of Life. Now, here's an example for you right here, John. Hatina finishes third in her last start, beating eight and a quarter lengths. Well, Road of Life won by six and a half, but only beat Hatina by a length and three quarters. All right, Hatina has shown she can handle the grass in the past because she's won on the grass and she's been in the money on the grass. Hatina's 17 to one tonight because Chris DiCarlo's in the irons, not Jose Santos. Only a length and three quarters separated them last time, but now we're talking 17 to 1 to 4 to, four to 1. So they're making their play on the betting strictly jockeys. jockeys. They're yeah, betting strictly jockeys. jockeys. So, and, but you've thrown it out. Yeah, well, she's an absolute throw out. Okay. All right, then we move to Save the Children. The Save the Children won at this distance two races back, but she was breaking her maiden. All right, now she stepped up into an allowance company last time out. She had a little excuse, as noted over here in the trouble line. She was in tight, and that means that when she, the series running started, she wasn't able to get loose. And I was happened to be there that evening and remember that she was pinned in down on the fence and really could not get, get to rolling. All right, now Marco Castaneda has been removed, and we put leading rider Julie Crone aboard. Yet yeah, she dropped down from 7 to 1 all the way down to 2 to 1, mostly because of Crone? Well, also... In this particular instance, we had a 12-horse field last time out, okay? And tonight we're only going with eight because we got the inner rail up, so they got the smaller turf course. So there's less betting interest, so the horse is going to take more money. But also, Julie Crone in the irons is certainly going to attract money. Rick, all the way back here to the uh, uh, type of race. You got a maiden special that uh, she broke her maiden. Right. Now she jumped up to a $17,000 uh, uh, allowance race. What's the difference in classes from a maiden special up to 17,000 claims. Well, uh, 17,000 Well, it varies, John, from racetrack to racetrack end of the time of year. At this time of year, the maiden special field that this filly beat was a very weak group of fillies, all right, because most good horses that are three years old have broken their maiden. I mean, this filly's within two months of becoming a four-year-old, all right? She breaks her maiden in September and didn't do it early in the spring, and it wasn't like... They didn't give her the opportunities. She had the opportunities. All these other fillies she raced against, Tanita, she's won back, Mended Heart, she won another race, headed north. Those horses all have won other races since she was still looking for her first win. So she's found a weaker bunch of horses that she managed to beat and was four to five the night she did it. Then she moves up into allowance company. But again, these are allowance horses that aren't pure allowance horses that are headed towards stakes races. These are Lesser allowance horses, they might win one or two of these, non-winners of one. They might run through non-winners of two, but they're not going to go much further. Rick, go to the uh, comparison to a, an allowance race as compared to what type claiming race uh, would these horses be if they were allowed to be claimed? 20,000 claim and 25,000? Somewhere claim? in between 20 and 35,000 at this time of year and this particular bunch. 
So, uh, so she jumped out of her class. When, uh, when these people are handicapping, uh, the, the second level of a player who we're talking to on this tape, then we've got to be able to distinguish the type of race that they're moving from, from the maiden up to the what class. How far can she expect to jump from a maiden special up to your opinion? Uh, well, she's going to take the logical step, which is the non-winners of one, which is what she's in tonight. She's in tonight, And yeah. how you figure that out is that sometimes you have to do a little research and look at back charts in the form, but she's the purse is $17,000. All right. right, then are they making her the, the, the favorite, uh, uh, the co-favorite, because of Julie Crone, or what other key thing in here did somebody see that made her the, the co-favorite? Well, I think Julie Crone certainly has a large part to do with it, and also the trainer. This is, as I said, Flint Schulhofer, Scotty, as he's known, is one of the top trainers in the game. Right? He's trained Dr. Carter, Smile. He's won uh, Breeders' Cup events. I mean, so he's well known in the game, and certainly the horse... Off oh, his last two races, it looks like she might be able to handle a little step up in class. Rick, we're back again to uh, uh, distance. We're going to mile on the 16th. Uh, was it a fast track? What was your last time? Firm, firm yeah. Right. I only said firm. Turf, yeah. turf firm. That's the, right here. Okay. FM is the firm. Give us a good time, an, uh, a pretty good time for a firm turf uh, mile on the 16th. All right. Well, this actually was very firm, and the last time was 42 and 1 for the final time, where she finished six and a half lengths off of it. Now, when she broke her maiden, the final time was 45 and 4, were 3 and 3 fifths seconds slower. All right, which accum according to the daily racing form, and most handicappers consider that a fifth of a second equals a length. All right, so 3 seconds would be 15 lengths. So we're saying that she was more than 15 lengths back if they'd run the last time, but she improved. See, she was only 6 off of it. So how much uh, emphasis do you put on the times uh, on their past race? How much do you use? We're going to go over this later on when we pop around the table, but how, how much emphasis do you put on times in your handicapping? I'm not a real big one on times, especially when we're running on the turf course. See, another thing here is this little star right here indicates that we were on the inner turf, as does this box. All right? That means it was an about distance, which also has a little reason to do with why this time was slower. They had to run further because the fence can be moved out anywhere from 5 feet to 18 feet. Well, how does a novice know that? Well, that's, he has to read the key, and that's what we're talking about right here, is that this star means an about distance, and the square box means it's the inner turf. Now, obviously, they should run their best times when it's a circled T, because that means it's the main turf course. All right? Mammoth, only, Mammoth and the Meadowlands only have one turf course. All right? So they change it and save parts of the course by moving what they call the Irish rail in and out. All right? And it changes the distance of the course. But and you're they, not using That's that why we're only running eight horses in this race, because there's not enough room no for room. 12 out there. But then you, don't, you, you more or less throw out a time. Uh, uh. On, the, on the turf course, I'm usually looking for horses that had a bad trip last time. The best horse does not always win on the turf. Okay. Not that the best horse wins all the time anyway, but certainly on the turf, there's a lot more chance to get in trouble and you wind up uh, with a good horse a lot of times getting beat. Then based on uh, the charts for the previous uh, three races back, uh, does she warrant two to one? No, she doesn't warrant two to one, sp strictly off that last effort. So she's not going to be in, uh, uh, you don't like her to win? No, but she certainly could be a factor. She's in fact She could be on the board. Because uh, uh, there's nothing against right. her. Okay, we got snow right, now we've got gal. no snow face gal, Gale, and snow face Gale has been running in very minor, or modest claiming events. Her entire career, she broke her maiden for 8,000. Obviously, the trainer has, is, just wants to get her on the grass course or is doing the racing secretary a favor by entering her because they needed a horse to make the race go, but that obviously wasn't the case because we had some on the AE. There was a lot of eligible. I, I can't, never raced on the grass. Right. Uh, is uh, unquestionably out for a workout. But you know, here's, here's a, uh, she showed some, she well, could, but yeah. see, she's never been on the grass, and they don't write grass races in New Jersey at Meadowlands and Monmouth for $6,500 fillies. I mean, the minimum is $20,000. Well, why do you think he wants to? Because he wants to see if she can handle it. Well, wouldn't she, uh, he have a better shot of picking up a paycheck at, at uh, the same class, $6,500, $7,500? He would, but uh, he's chose for to bring For some reason, he's he chose to, matter of fact, he's shipping up from Philadelphia Park. This horse has been running down in Philly, and now he's going to pay the van expense to get her up here to run her. Yeah, I mean, I can't use her. But somebody is going to, to, to throw a couple of dollars yeah, on well, her. She's, 
Just for uh, she's fifty to one. Fifty to one. So and somebody played her. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying to you. How could anybody who's doing any type of handicapping even take a shot at this? I mean, it's it's clear. It's completely out of its class. It shouldn't even be fifty to one. Well, um, the first time on the weeds, and the guy's taking a shot. He's yep. hoping that that moves her up. All right. The next horse we get to is Law Update. All right. And Law Update comes out of an allowance race that was run on the main track. All right, where she finished fifth, but if you go back to a race before that, she comes out of a real good race here at the Meadowlands, a race that went 10 and 4 for the first three quarters, finished up in 42 and 4. She won that event that night, it was for a claiming price of 32,000, and now she steps back into allowance against uh, back on the weeds. All right, throw at her last on the dirt. She's three for seven lifetime on the turf, and also I has seven in the money. Right. That's, that's my pick for that. Uh, I can see this. Uh, now, why, okay, just take this here. Uh, uh, why would a trainer who's uh, uh, banged out a win at 32,000 claiming on a turf, why would he take uh, uh, and, and, and now put her on the, uh, on the dirt? Why, why would he swing over after she's proven she could win at 2 to 1, nice price, 280, and now put him on the dirt? Why, why the switch? Well, because there might have been rain and we might have been canceled off the turf, right? We only had six go that night, so that looks like that was one of those instances. All right, only six horses went in that particular race. That's only right. On the right hand yeah. side, the race was probably scheduled to be on the turf course, but we had rain the night before, or two days before, and of course, since we only have the one turf course, we got to save it. So the race was probably taken off the grass, and that's why it wound up on the dirt. So now back again, she warrants a two to one uh, uh, figure. You like her? Yeah, I like her. That's what. That's my selection for the race. Who's your Who's your backup pick? The backup. I would take uh, Save the Children and uh, Miss Sarah Joy. So in other words, you'd box them, or would you put uh, Law Update on top? I'd put Law Update on top. On top, and crisscross yeah. them with them, too? Yeah. Oh, um, oh, no, I'm sorry. You don't, you don't want to crisscross them. Law Update, how many would you put in, in a back of her? You're going to throw out uh, Snowface right. Gale. I've thrown her out. Hatina, I'm throwing, thrown out. Out. I'm throwing out all the rest. I'm taking Miss Sarah Joy all right, and Save the Children. I'm using her underneath. And might box the top. And box the other. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and you still like this one uh, all the way? Yeah, that's who I like. That's okay. I agree with you here. Don't forget, I haven't seen this after I saw this. I still like Miss Sarah Joy for a piece and a law update. It's got all the credentials. Okay. We'll take a look at this race. They're in the gate. And uh, they're off. Save the Children comes out running for the lead. Law Update is right there on the outside. And toward the inside, it's Atina. And down on the in inside, it's Miss Sarah Joy. They pass us the first time. Miss Sarah Joy and Hatina now. And those two are at it head-to-head -head early. Just in behind them, Galaxy Miss is now running in third position. And on the outside, Save the Children has been gathered back and forth. And then it's Private Fame, fifth toward the inside. Law Update moves to the rail racing sixth. And Snowface Girl is allowed to... Settle in an easy gallop early as they make their way onto the backstretch with Miss Sarah Joy now out there by two and a half. Hatina now back racing in second and to her inside Galaxy Miss is running in third. And then it's Private Fame now headstrong and moving through in between horses from fourth. And Save the Children now is moving strongly on the far outside with a four wide move down the backstretch. Just in behind that group it's Law Update and Snow Face Gale now launching her bid from the back of the pack. Three furlongs to run. It's Miss Sarah Joy now. And on the outside, Private Fame to engage her. Those two hook up as they enter the far turn now. Save the Children now rallies in third. On the outside, Snowface Gale has asked for more run. She's now fourth. Law Update is now back to fifth. Then farther back, Galaxy Miss and Hatina. And they're coming to the top of the stretch. Miss Sarah Joy still trying to fight off Private Fame. Those two still head to head. And they're set down for the drive. Coming up the inside, Law Update. She'll need racing room now and angle out for it. Miss Sarah Joy still there by a length. Law update now kicking in a 16th from home. Miss Sarah Joy put to a hard drive. Law update with one final desperate lunge. Here's the wire and it is Miss Sarah Joy in a fast closing law update. Snowface Gale was third. You know, uh, we want to go over some uh, money management and discipline, which is going to be the whole key. So you take the handicapping techniques that uh, Rick went over and we're going to apply money management. I want you to remember couple of statistics. The favorite in a race will win one-third of the time. The second choice in a betting will win approximately 20% of the time. And the third favorite wins about 13% of the time. Now, the top three choices in a betting will win two out of three 
uh, uh, races. This is based on, on a study run over years and years and thousands of races. Now you take the top three choices in a race. Now think of this statistic. The top three choices will come in first or second 90% of the time. I want you to think about that when you do your handicapping. Uh, my theory of play is very conservative. Uh, I told you plenty of times before, uh, you need a bankroll, knowledge, money management, and discipline. You have to have money to play with. You have to be knowledgeable. You have to know everything there is to know about the races. In this case here, everything that Rick talked about that he broke down for you, that's knowledge. How do you handicap? How do you take the information out of the daily racing form and apply it to your handicapping? Money management, what do you bet when you win? What do you bet when you lose? I'm going to give you some ideas as to what I would do if I were playing uh, uh, the races and uh, how much would I bet after each race. And, of course, discipline is the guts to walk by setting the two things that you have to set whenever you gamble, a win goal and a loss limit, an amount of money that you want to win that day, and when you reach that amount, you must quit, and a loss limit, an amount of money you will lose based on your total bankroll, and you must quit. Let's touch on bankroll first. Suppose you're going to the track, and you've got $100 with you. Now, I believe in throwing out races. I'm not going to bet a maiden race. This is just my opinion. Uh, I am not going to bet on maidens. I'm not going to bet on low claiming races. I'm not going to bet on uh, uh, 12 horse fields, 11 horse fields. I'm going to bet only from an 8 horse field and down. I reduce my chances of losing. And then when I finally do decide on a race, I'm going to handicap down to the three best horses in the race and make my choice based on those best three races, uh, best three horses. And since I've told you that uh, they're going to win 90% of the time or be in first or second 90% of the time, well, naturally that's where I want my money riding. Let's suppose uh, we go to the track, and I've looked through the card, and I've thrown out uh, it's 11, horse, uh, 11 uh, races on the night. I've thrown out six races. I've come down to I've got five races left. I've got $100 to play with. I'm going to put $20 up on every race. That's the most I'm going to put on a race, $20 allocated, and based on the fact that if I lost all five races, the most I'm going to lose is the $100. Now, I figured I'd at least have some kind of a return out of the money I'm putting up. So I'm not going to reinvest at all, so at least I'm going to go home with some type of a, of a dollar uh, amount so that I don't get wiped out. Psychologically, you don't want to get wiped out when you go someplace because you're scared to go back the next time. So suppose we're in the third race, and I've put a $20 that I'm going to put into a, a race. Now, there's the $20. Now, I'm going to break it down into if I have one horse that I'm going to bet on. Suppose I've only got one horse. Now, I'm going to take this $20, I'm going to spread it on that one horse. If, for instance, I like it uh, to win the race, I'm going to put $10 to win on it. But since I like it to win, I'm going to put 5 to place and 5 to show. Or I could put 5 to win, 10 to place, and 5 to show. In other words, that's going to be up to you how you're going to allocate this $20. Now, if you've got a horse that's going off at 3 to 5, I'm not going to bet to show. In fact, I wouldn't bet a, uh, a horse going off at 3 to 5 because the amount of the return is not going to be worth the investment. Go to a, an even money pick. If I like a horse at even money, chances are the show pool is going to be so low that you're not going to get a return by betting show. So I would go $10 win, $10 place. But you notice that what I'm going to do is rearrange the allocated $20 uh, that I put aside for this particular race to be a, a bet. Now, if I'm going to go into exactors, suppose, like Rick uh, pointed out in one of the races, that he liked a particular horse. Uh, this was his uh, blue chip special. I'm making a blue chip. That was his blue chip special. That's the horse he really liked. And he liked two others in the race, too. So what he is going to do, he'll take $5 and he'll place it on his winning, uh, uh, the one that he believes is the best horse of all. And then he's going to take $15 and he's going to put it into a uh, boxed uh, exacta. Now, I talked about $100. If you bring $600 or $800 or $1,000 or $3,000 to the, to the track, you're going to still break it down into an equal amount of your bankroll per race. I'm talking about a $100 bankroll, and you can allocate it to the amount of money that you bring down. So in this case here, you've got $5 on your best pick, and then you've got $15 crisscross into an exacta. Now suppose on that first race, you lose the entire $20, nothing comes out. And in the fifth race, which was the next race you were going to bet, since you lost a whole $20, the amount that you're going to bet, bet in the fifth race is a total of $20. You're not going to go any higher. You're not going to try to recoup. Now let's go to the fact that you won on that first race, suppose you won $10. So you had a profit of uh, $10 for this race. So on the next race, which was the fifth one, you're going to take the $20 that you uh, set aside for the fifth race, and you're going to bet that. And you're going to take the $10 that you won, 
put one half of the winnings into the fifth race and pocket the other five dollars. So that on this race here, you would bet twenty-five dollars. Uh, if you were uh, betting two hundred dollars on this particular race and you won a hundred, then your next race would be two hundred dollars plus one half of the profit of a hundred, which would be fifty dollars. And you would break it down into the amount that you're going to wager on your second race of the night. Now suppose we come into the third uh, race. You've got twenty dollars that you've automatically set aside, and if there is any extra that you're going to bet. Is going to be based on 50% of the amount you won on the prior race. Now, if you lost that, fi that, uh, that fifth race, you'd have to go back to $20. You wouldn't go back to the $5 you have left over from the third race. You'd only bet the profit that was, uh, that was gleaned from the fifth race. Let's suppose that when you walked into the track and you set an amount of money you wanted to win that night, you had $100. You said, well, if I win 60% of that $100, in this case here, $60, then I won't bet anymore. Now it's going to be tough. Suppose you reach that $60 profit. You've won 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 dollars. You grind it out over your first three races. You don't have to bet the fourth and the fifth race. See if you've got the guts to walk away with just your profit. If in fact that you're going to reinvest any portion of that money into the fourth and fifth races after you've reached your profit of $60, this is going to be the difference between whether you're a disciplined player or not. You can't put the whole amount back. I would go back for one half of the amount of my total win goal. So if I set $60 as my goal, then the absolute maximum I'd go back with is $30. Personally, I'd walk out with my total amount of $60. However, after the third race, if I had set my win goal at $60 and I ended up with $80 at the end of that uh, race, I put aside the 60 I was guaranteed for and on the next race I would bet $10. Not the $20 allocated for the race, but $10, the amount of the excess that was gleamed on the first three races. If I won any amount of money on that particular race, which was the fourth race in our betting, in this case here, suppose we won $20, I would put the entire amount up on the last race because I've already got my win goal socked away. You only become an aggressive better after your win goal is put, a, uh, put aside. Now, that's going to be hard to do for you people who, as we stipulated in the beginning of the tape, was the uh, level two player. Now, uh, we're talking about the novice, the basic players, never played before, or goes maybe once or twice a year. We're trying to reach the intermediate player. It goes down 8, 10, 12 times a year. You've got to be able to allocate uh, win goals and loss limits. For the stronger player, we'll go into that on another tape. Now, just go back again uh, for the uh, total amount of money that you're going to lay out. You don't have to bet every race. The amount of money you're going to bet per race if you're an exacta player, trifecta player, which I do not agree with, I don't believe you should be in a trifecta player. It's tough enough to pick a horse to come into money than to try to pick three of them and come in one, two, three. But I can see boxing three uh, uh, races as uh, Rick went over in some of his handicapping. He took a, a, a race and he ended up with three uh, horses that he liked, one that he liked a lot and two others. Now he could put an extra amount of money on that first one and then box the others. But if he likes all the same amount with none standing out, then you could box three ra horses in a race. And that's going to be in a small field whereby you're able to throw out about five race, uh, horses in that race that have no chance at all. And the last thing I want to touch on is when you talk about exactors, is, is if you like a horse, a blue chip, you like him a lot, you could put him on top of three or four uh, other horses that you believe have a chance to win but are secondary to this particular horse. If you like every horse in the field, then you would wheel him with every horse. That means every single solitary one was going to get a piece of it. But my opinion is that you've got to be, have the guts or the ability or the knowledge to throw out a couple of, of uh, horses. I mean, you're going to find some eight to ones that don't have a prayer. And you're going to have to learn how to do this handicapping. So, going to a track, you have to bring enough money to bet all the races. You've got to have the knowledge uh, to handicap every single race. You've got to know how to bet. What do you bet when you win? What do you bet when you lose? And you've got to have the discipline or the guts to quit when you get ahead. It's gambling. Don't be a gambler. Just be a smart player. Okay? All right, uh, you know what we're going to do is we're going to wrap it down. Now, uh, we had Rick give us handicapping on everything. We're going to have a little bit of money management. I'm just going to give a, a couple of bullet questions, and uh, maybe you get an idea as, uh, as to how you should handicap. Hey, Rick, for the level two player, which, you know, basic, then level two, and then uh, experience, level two player, the main things he's got to throw out. What he's looking to throw out, what I'd throw out, what I'm looking for when I go over a race are the, obviously the top contenders. Now, normally the top contenders are trained by the top trainers, ridden by the top jockeys. 
So I'm going to right away get rid of horses that aren't trained by trainers that are on that leading trainer list and ridden by jockeys that are on that leading jockey list. So you're looking for them. That, that's, your, that's your top uh, thing. That's Do you disagree with uh, what I said about throwing out uh, large horse fields? Yeah, well, I don't have problems with a large horse field as long as I've got early speed. If I can establish position, everybody else is behind me. They're the ones that got to worry about the trouble. So I'm not worried about that. Okay, how about in a, uh, a large field, uh, a speed horse, where do you want him coming out of? What, uh, uh, do you figure if he's coming out of number one uh, uh, shoot, uh, he's got to get to the front because if he gets boxed in, he's got to come around the whole field, especially in a six furlong race. You don't feel Yeah, like the number one post is a, a disadvantage in a sprint race yeah. because the whole field, if you don't break well, if you break a little flat-footed, the whole field can close over on you. Now you're last, and then now you've got to circle the whole field. So you need a strong uh, uh, jump uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a sprint. Yeah. I mean, I'd prefer to have the outside. I'd like to have the 10-hole, the 9-hole. You do like that. If I've got early speed, right? Because I can control the pace from out there. See, I'm lapped at. Horses run better on the outside of other horses. When you get a horse pinned in on the rail, only real good horses will run their best. All right? A lot of horses get faint-hearted when there's a horse on the outside of them. Oh, they get scared? They get frisky? They get scared. and then Plus, horses will bear out in the stretch, right? If you're bearing out from the one hole, you're going to hit somebody, good chance you're coming down. But if I'm lapped outside of you and I start to bear out and there's nobody outside of me, I've just got the track to drift in. Okay, so you're really keying on uh, early speed, which uh, you, you say you like. Go back to this uh, 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 dropping in class, uh, uh, a big edge or a little edge. Depends on, on the horse and on the trainer. Has the horse, how long has the horse been away? How long has he been out? Has he, he's dropping in class off a terrible effort, a good effort. Is the trainer known for these type of moves? Like your top claiming trainers, the reason they're the top claiming trainers is because they win most of the races. How do they win? Because they run horses where they belong. So he's not afraid to lose the horse because his owners know that he's produced for them. So if he's driving a horse from 10,000 down to 8,000, I'm not afraid of that horse. I love the horse. The horse is going to run. If he gets taken, the owner knows that the trainer will go get him another one. I, I, you know, you, you see these tout sheets. I'm going to jump over to tout sheets before I go back again to handicapping. These guys that sell uh, the tickets at, outside the track, or the the, uh, the trackman, the handicap, the analyst, uh, and the consensus in the uh, racing forum. What, what's your opinion of their picks? Well, those people put time in, and they're certainly trying to pick winners, as everyone that goes to track is. And the reason, one of the reasons I wanted to do this video with you was because not enough people buy the racing form. I mean, to me, the enjoyment out of horse racing is the intellectual challenge of going in there and picking your own winners. I don't want to buy a tout sheet and have some guy tell me, hey, bet the five in the fifth race. I mean, what fun is that? You've got to be able to handicap. Sure. I mean, that's what the game's all about, is trying to figure out what are these guys up to? Why are they moving this horse into that spot? Why didn't he run them back in this other spot? How come he's, he's not running them on the grass? This horse looks like he could turf, but he insists on running this horse going three quarters. Rick, you know, we, uh, we didn't uh, uh, touch on, uh, when you go to handicapping, you didn't put that much emphasis on, uh, on speed. You, you know, I mean, on these uh, past performance speed ratings, when you get the call at the, uh, uh, when well, you get two calls in a six furlong uh, race, you're going to get these two calls. You don't, you don't put that much uh, uh, oomph into that. Uh... Well, I'm not a real big speed handicapper, but certainly there are races that the form supplies you with the, with the speed figure. That, that figure is based off of the track record at that distance. All right, now, real speed handicappers have their own set of figures, yeah. and they come up with different numbers to work from rather than the track record because they realize that $5,000 horses are not up to a track record, right? that, that a good time for them for three quarters might be 12. All right, so then they'll work their speed figures off of that kind of number. I'm not, I'm not a big one for, for speed figures, but you can, just by using the tracks, I mean the tracks, I keep going to the track, it's the racing forms, speed figures, that if you find a horse in there that has much better numbers than everybody else in there, there's a good chance he's going to win. There's also going to be an excellent chance he's going to be a strong favorite. You know, uh, you don't use the board as a criterion for making any of your tra handicapping at all. You base it strictly on what you can find in the, uh, in the racing forms. Well, I'll let the board sway me in a two-year-old main event of first-time starters. All right, if some horse that has very poor workouts and is 10 to 1 on the morning line is 4 to 1. I mean, then that horse gets my attention. Something's live there. Sure. If the barn likes the horse, 
That's how you almost have to play two-year-old races, where nobody has any form. Nobody's shown they can run. The only people who know they can run are the connections of the horse and the clockers. All right, go into, uh, uh, when you talk about the, uh, the barn putting a, uh, uh, dropping a, a piece on it, there's two types of, of drops that they're going to make. One is an early drop, which a, the, uh, a 10 to 1 horse goes automatically right down, a big piece of change goes all around and brings them right down to a, a 6 to 5 favorite. And then they start working against that 6 to 5. And then there's the uh, 10 to 1 shot that in the last two minutes clicks down to 5 to 1, 6 to 1. What do you like better, the early drop or the late drop? Oh, the late drop. You like that better? I mean, those are the serious players. They're holding the money. That's usually somebody who just went up there and took a big punch. And then if you're sharp enough to see it, then everybody else follows that in. Of course, now you're not going to want to do this unless it's a horse that you like to begin with. All right? But if you see a horse that should be 8-1 to one and sits at 8-1, to one and then all of a sudden you look up and they're in the gate and there's maybe 30 seconds left before they're going to break and you look up and this, this horse is now 3-1, to one, that horse took a serious punch. But a horse that takes a big punch early normally is a horse that there's money that a bookie's laying off at the racetrack. So he's Somebody a called up, I want to bet 4000 on this horse. So the bookie goes down, he puts 2000 in on the first flash. So now the horse opens up as a short price. It gets everybody's attention because there's plenty of time for everybody to see that. Yeah. So you're looking and you say, wow, why is this horse even money? So you start looking at him in the past performances. Well, he's even money because the bookie doesn't mind eating a $2,000 bet at even money. But he certainly didn't want to eat 4000 at 15 to 1. 15 to 1. Right, how about your, uh, uh, do you watch the place and show pools? Do you let that be a... Uh, any type of uh, uh, part of your handicapping? Yeah, if I see a horse that has, is way out of line and has no money in the place pool, all right, then, then you know this is, this is a live horse and they think they're going to win. As if a horse is 4 to 1, but you look up, he has no place money on him. I mean, this is a well men horse. Okay, now like how about they you? think they've found out a little something about him. If his form doesn't look like he should be 4 to 1, then they think they know something. So you're looking for that. How about the running amount uh, that they're going to pay off on the exactus? Do you compare the amount of the price on the board to the amount of money that's in the uh, exacta pool? Like you might get a, the two and three horse is going to pay uh, an exacta of nine to uh, nine dollars, and and yet on the board the, the horse is going off at eight to one. Uh, well, you <laughs> six I to one. think you always see that at minor racetracks. I was involved in one of those one day where the exacta came back shorter than the win price that's on the right. winner. Yeah, yeah when the, something like that happens, obviously. Somebody bet some serious money on it. Hey, Rick, uh, you disagreed with me already, uh, we, which we know this is not pre-planned. Uh, Rick disagreed with me on uh, throwing out large fields, so he likes large fields, so you have to make your decision on that. Uh, what else did I talk about? Uh, is eliminating horses as uh, much as I can and then narrowing it down to the last uh, uh, three and then doing my handicapping on three. Am, am I in the ballpark? And, sure, and, that's and what I mean. Like that? You've got to get rid of the pretenders and come up with the contenders. Let's just get rid of There's no sense wasting your time going over and over these horses that have no shot. All right? I know everybody likes to cash a big ticket, but as you stated before, 67% of the races are won by the first three choices. That's right. So why are we spending a lot of time trying to make some horse that's 50 to 1 win? When those horses win, you just got to say, hey, some guy made a score. God bless him. But if he's there every day playing those kind of horses, He's not going to be in the game too long. He's not going to be the kind of customer that the racetrack's looking for and certainly not going to make his pocket happy. He's happy one night, he has the big night, buys a color TV, and then he goes through four months and he doesn't cash a ticket. They don't win that often, especially at, at tracks that where you see the same horses all the time. You might find that in, down in Florida where they have horses coming in from all over the country and people don't know all the horses. But at a track where you have the same trainers, same jockeys, you, those type of horses just don't win that often. Uh, I just want to re-elaborate on horses being shipped in from another uh, track. Do you like a newcomer coming on the uh, track, or would you like to get him a, uh, a pop under his belt before you start putting your money down on him? Depends on the trainer. If I know his reputation, certainly I like to see some fresh horses. Any, wherever I am, I like to see fresh horses. I don't, I don't like to see the same horses competing against one another all the time. Oh, so you see, you know, you know I find uh, the toughest, in, and uh, from my own standpoint of handicapping, getting into an allowance race or a $25,000, $35,000 claiming race, we come down to three equal horses, uh, a three to one, a five to two, and a uh, four to one. Uh, none of them is a clear-cut favorite. All three of them have shown a lot of of a strength. I mean, there's, this, is, this is where it comes down to really handicapping. What's going to separate, Rick, those last three uh, like I said, a 5-2, to two, a 3-1, to one, and a 4-1, to one, they all look good. What do you use as the final edge? It's, it's only a seven-horse field. 
You've thrown out the other four, and you're down to the last three. It's a type of race you want to bet on, class horses, small fields. What do you use as your, your final edge in that? Uh, no. Assuming the tra I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. Assuming the trainers and the jockeys are all, uh, all equal. equal. I'm going to make you sweat on this one. So it's a pretty fictitious situation that all well, trainers and jockeys yeah, are equal. Yeah, you're right. Okay. But, uh, but if we had trainer? that scenario, yeah. well, then I'm going to look for pace. I want to see who, if, if there's three equal horses, but one of them has more speed than the others, and he's going to get an unattended lead, then he's my horse. Then you're going to the speed as your first thing sure. that you're looking for. If there's two speed horses in the race that figure they're going to run head and head with one another, of course, then I'm going to want the horse that can stay close and figures to run by those two after they tire from their early efforts. They're going to burn, uh, the first two speed horses are going to burn, burn each other out. Uh, go back again to the uh, late money. You don't let uh, that be at the... Uh, you know, the deciding factor on... Uh, in that particular race? In that particular no, race. That was, money in that race wouldn't swim me one, one way whatsoever. So you're going to the speed uh, uh, in a race like that. And I'm... If, if he can make an unattended lead, he has... It's the pace. The pace makes the race. If a horse can get loose on a lead, they run a lot better. But when a horse is hooked all the way, then obviously the race sets up for a horse that can lay off of that and not use up as much of his energy early and then has something left for the drive. All right, and, and now, in a lot of the handicap when we did those races uh, before, uh, I like the fact that you only went back three, four races. You very rarely went back eight, nine, ten uh, uh, races. What is the maximum amount of races that you'll go back on a horse to do your serious handicap? Well, I'll go back a few if we can find excuses for the, for the last three. All right, we've got to look over at the beginning of the running line and decide well, we're looking at a horse running on a fast racetrack. We've got a fast racetrack tonight. But all of a sudden you look up and this horse has been on sloppy track last three starts, right? And all three times runs poorly. I can, throw, I can eliminate those. And that's when you'll catch a big price. Or the horse has been running on the grass and then you look over at the horse's lifetime record on the grass. Well, and you can see this over and over again. There's a lot of trainers use this technique. The horse is 0 for 8 on the grass, never hit the board, but on the grass last three starts. Now all of a sudden the horse is on the main track, gets a fast race track. I mean, this is not by mistake. This is by design. Yeah. He's got three bad running lines. He knows he's going to get a little higher morning line, and he knows that the, the fans are pretty much going to ignore this. And you gotta, you, you're trying to pick that up. All right, here's what we, we want to do. We've got to wrap this up. I uh, hope you picked up something from it, but I want to put him on a spot. Uh, I'm going to give you, you've got to give me three bullet things to look for for the level two player. Uh, he's going down there. Now at all, everything you said, we've said in the tape, now at all the way down to three bullet things you're looking for. You. Right. I'm looking for a horse that has been active in the last 20 days. And showing consistent right, he's, form. And has shown that he can win at the level he's running for today. Okay. All right. Has won at this level in the past. Has run within the last 20 days. Unless it's a filly. A filly, I'll give a little leeway. They, can, they run well fresh. Some fillies don't. They can't take hard training. And they run their best races when they haven't been to the track in a while. But that horse still, I would want to see a workout underneath that horse. But for your basic bread and butter claiming horse, your six-year-old gelding that's already started 70 times in his life, if he's not out there, there's a reason, there's a, and the reason's not good, all right? It's, he's got a problem, and they're working on it, so he's not going to be fit. So I want something that's been on the racetrack, right. got to be active, all right? He's got to have won for the money that he's running for today, all right? He has to have won for that, or more, obviously. If he won for right. 14, he's in for the dime today, then obviously... He's, he's a solid play, yeah. and he has to have won at that distance. Okay, uh, you, you know, you, you bring up something. I didn't want to uh, uh, go back over this. Uh, Philly's running against uh, Colts. Uh, and Edge, one way or the other? Uh, edge, certainly when they're uh, claiming horses. Edge to whom? 20, 000, edge to the Colts, Geldings. All right, Gelding against, uh, oh, then you already answered it. Gelding against the Philly. They got a little bit of an edge. Yeah, definite edge. When you get into top-notch horses, the best grass horses... In the world, in the last few years, there have been some superior grass fillies. Miesk is one. She destroyed the Colts in the Breeders' Cup two years in a row. There was nobody around that could run with her going a flat mile on the grass. Dahlia, going back a few years, was a tremendous filly. All along, won the Breeders, won, I think she won the second Breeders' Cup at Aqueduct. That was another filly. Nobody was going to beat her that day. So they can run, the, uh, the top-class fillies can run with the top Colts, but it's in a, in a lower level. But in the lower levels, you very rarely see a trainer even trying to They wouldn't even the try. Colts. I was going to say that they don't try it, but it's just something that they, they got to pick out. Yeah, so a good, a good move used to be run a filly against the Colts, all right, and then bring her back against Phillies. But Phillies. it looks like she hasn't made a move in class, and in reality, she and has. And you get a price. 
Yeah. Okay. And they get a little bit of a price. All right, uh, I hope you picked up something about uh, handicapping. I mean, you, you got the best. I mean, he's the, one of the top handicappers in the country. If you haven't picked up from what he has to say, you'll never be a handicapper. You're going to have to pop the tape over five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times because in every race that he handicapped and in every one of the instances that he picked apart a, a, a race and a, and a horse in particular, he gave you something that you can grasp. Now, it's up to you to decide on the ones that he likes the best. I tried to keep bringing him down to pinpoint, and you notice he never wavered. Uh, he kept going over the same strong handicapping tools. Uh, so if you're interested in going to the track, I'm very conservative. So uh, uh, Rick, who ties in both looking for the price and the con conservative, puts it all together in a strong handicapping system. I hope you use the money management uh, uh, that we talked about. But basically, I hope you go with the idea that uh, it's possible to win at the uh, races. And you pay attention to what Rick gave you. And if you can't win, it's, you'll never be a handicapper. Okay?